Good evening and welcome to the council meeting for April 9th. Would you please join us in uh, the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Madam Clerk, would you please do the roll call? Council Member Irwin? Here. Council Member Price? Here. Council Member Adam? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Fox? Here. Mayor Bill De La Pena? Present. And moving on to item number four, we do have a request for a change in our agenda. We will actually, after public comments, move to closed session to hear items 15A and 15B. That will be extremely brief, approximately five minutes. Is that okay with the council? Thank you. All right, and now we will do the special presentations and announcements. And um, for that, I will hobble over to the podium, so please give me a couple of minutes. <laughs> All right, I'm here. See what can happen when you're having too much fun with your twins during spring break, with your kids. All right. And speaking of children, our first presentation tonight is a very special one. I would like to invite the Conejo Valley School District Director of Special Education, Dr. Antonio Castro, to the podium. April is Autism Awareness Month, and autism is a lifelong development difference altering an individual's ability to learn. These differences include social behaviors in verbal, nonverbal, and reciprocal communications. With a greater recognition and understanding of autism, we can ensure that affected individuals are accurately diagnosed, resulting in education, interventions, community acceptance and accommodations which are vital to their future growth and development. Fortunately, the Conejo Valley School District provides children with autism the tools they and their parents need to communicate and uh, the school district also offers specialized academic instructional programs. Dr. Castro, I would like to present the Conejo Valley School District with this Autism Awareness Month proclamation. And on behalf of the entire city council, I would like to thank you and the school district for offering these academic programs. And I will read a little bit uh, from that before I present you the uh, proclamation. Autism is a lifelong developmental difference associated with significant alteration of an individual's ability to learn in the same way as average students. And that may include differences in social behaviors and uh, verbal communication. Persons with autism encounter challenges in environments designed for neurologically typical people. And whereas autism affects people regardless of sex, race, religion, socioeconomic status, or geography, and the incidence of autism in the United States is greater than one in 150 and is four times more likely to affect boys, according to the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. And whereas a child is diagnosed with autism every 20 minutes, resulting in another family being drawn into the struggles presented by this syndrome, and whereas evidence suggests autism is the result of neurological anomalies affecting the functioning of the brain and the body, but few members of the general public, schools, and medical community fully understand this complex syndrome. Autism is a complex set of differences that requires increased personal research to one day better understand it, and a greater recognition and understanding of autism can ensure that individuals and families affected by autism living in the Conejo Valley and all other Americans with autism are accurately diagnosed and appropriately treated throughout their lives. And now, therefore, I, the mayor of the city of Thousand Oaks, on behalf of the entire city council, do hereby proclaim April 2013 as Autism Awareness Month. And I urge, and we urge, all residents to join with the Conejo Valley Unified School District to support awareness efforts in order to educate parents, professionals, 
and the general public about autism and its effects. Dr. Castro, thank you very much for everything that you do to help children with autism become part of mainstream. Thank you. For our next presentation, I would like to invite the City of Thousand Oaks Deputy Library Director, Nancy Schramm, to the podium. Oh, there she is. All right. April 14th through the 20th, which is next week, is, the National, is National Library Week. The theme is You Belong at Your Library. In honor of National Library Week, I would like to encourage our residents to visit the library well, both of them, both of the libraries we have at, on Jance Road and Newberry Park, and to take advantage of the wonderful resources we have available. Libraries have served as a great resource of knowledge, providing free access to their array of collections. Our librarians plan and design programs to provide our residents with resources they need in this ever-changing society. Nancy, so please accept this proclamation on behalf of your dedicated staff in honor of National Library Week. And I do want to add that my son, whom you met yesterday, is an insatiable reader and just loved the Newberry Park Library. Uh, he's, he's already checked out so many books. So um, we, on behalf of the entire city council, I would like to uh, proclaim April 14th through 20th at National Library Week in Thousand Oaks and encourage all residents to visit the library this week and every week, actually, to take advantage of the wonderful resources that we have. Thank you, and congratulations. Yes, please, go ahead. Never pass up an opportunity to talk about the library. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and good evening, city council members and city staff. National Library Week is the perfect time to celebrate the Thousand Oaks Library and to recognize the impact the library has on the community. I always like to remind people that even if you are not a library user, the library impacts you because it impacts the community where you live. We are very lucky in Thousand Oaks to have a well-supported premier library that can really make a difference in people's lives. Um, and one of the things the library does is to offer excellent recreational, educational, informational programs for people of all ages. During National Library Week 2013, the library will be hosting a slate of programs, and I'll just mention a few. Saturday, April 13th at 1 o'clock at the Grant Tower Brim Hall Library, The Chew Mash by Dr. Kent, Kent Christensen, who will talk about chew mash artifacts and have a display. Sunday, April 14th at 2 p.m. at the Grant Tower Brim Hall Library, writing a mystery novel. How do authors do that? It's a writing workshop presented by Patricia Smiley, president of the Southern California Sisters in Crime. Tuesday, April 16th at 3 p.m. at the Grant Tower Brim Hall Library. Join us for Wonders of Our Aquarium, an informational program on our amazing aquarium with Marv Stanton of Executive Aquarium, and it will give people an opportunity to ask questions about the fish or about the aquarium. And Thursday, April 18th at 4 p.m. at the Newberry Park Branch Library at 6.30 p.m. I'm sorry, at 4 o'clock p.m. to 6.30 p.m., a special night of reading for preschoolers through third graders presented by the Thousand Oaks Teen Advisory League. And the last one I'll mention is Saturday, April 20th at 2 p.m. at the Grant Tower Brim Hall Library, Songs We Sing, a family program that explores vocal music from chorale to opera to jazz, and musical theater with faculty and students from California Lutheran University. So I invite you to please join us for these excellent programs, and we thank you for your recognition of National Library Week.
And our last presentation is going to be a lot of fun. I would like to invite Cabrillo Music Theater Artistic Director Louis Wilkenfeld to join me at the podium. And uh, we have some really cool entertainment tonight. Yeah, Go ahead. You, you saw a little yeah. bit, didn't you? Yes, uh, you. I love it. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Um, first of all, I'm really glad you're honoring the library. We took the entire cast of Your Good Man, Charlie Brown, to the Thousand Oaks Public Library and did an event there about a week, two weeks before we performed the show. The room was packed, and a show like that, which is based on writing, based on these, these great books, it was a great melding of two media. I hope to continue doing that. Uh, so I'm really glad to be part of the library uh, week this week. I want to let you know, before I talk about Greece, our next Next show is Legally Blonde, the musical. It'll be this summer in the Civic Arts Plaza. We just had auditions locally. We saw over 500 people for this show. Uh, we're using the original Broadway choreography that was nominated for a Tony. And we'll be continuing our outreach programs this summer. We're, we're going to have our animal rescue program in, uh, back in action again, as we do with every show that's themed to animals. Elle Woods, of course, has her pet bruiser. But many of these animals don't have homes. So we're going to have all um, of the many uh, animal rescue organizations bringing their, pe their animals who need homes to the theater. They'll be lined up outside the theater at every performance. We've been able to find homes for over 100 animals so far in our previous shows, and we're going to do this again this summer. Uh, I also want to tell you that we um, have our next season of shows coming up. I'm very excited to share this with you. It's, it's our 20th anniversary, uh, as it is for many things going on here in the Civic Arts Plaza. And I don't know if you know this, that the Music Man was the very first show to take place in the Civic Arts Plaza. It was a Cabrillo Music Theater show in 1994. So we're ce celebrating our 20th anniversary. We're going to start, I bring giant props like a comic. Uh, we're going to start with Kiss Me Kate, the musical in the fall. And I hope to work again with the library on this, because of course it's based on William Shakespeare. Uh, we'll bring back Forever Plaid in the, in the winter. The brand new Tony winning musical In the Heights, very contemporary, will be our spring show and will end in the summer of 2014 with Bye Bye Birdie. We call our season moving forward and looking back. It's got a little of everything and we're very, very excited about it. So we, uh, we're in the middle of taking, uh, finishing up our renewals and taking new subscribers and we hope that uh, many people will join us for that. Now I want to talk about, about Greece. It opens this Friday. In fact, we're rehearsing right next door in the Civic Arts Plaza. We're going right back to start our tech tonight as soon as this is over. We uh, run April 12th through the 21st, right here in the Cavalry Theater. It's the first time Cabrillo Music Theater has ever produced Grease, it's a, and, it's, uh, and we're, we're taking it this weekend and next. Tickets are on sale at Ticketmaster or at the Civic Arts Plaza box office or at cabrillomusictheater.com. I want to remind you that there's some adult material, um, uh, immature language, and uh, some outrageous gestures, but nothing that the city council would not have seen, so I guess we're okay. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but I also want to introduce to you our director and choreographer who are sitting right here. Uh, Barry Pearl is our director. He was duty in the movie of Greece. And Kelly Ward is our choreographer who played Putsy in the movie of Greece. <laughs> They've been passing on their knowledge of Greece to the next generation. And you're going to be pleased with this group of people. Uh, from a casting process of 500, we have 16 incredibly talented young people. Uh, and then on top of that, Adrian Zmed will join us uh, to play the teen angel and sing Beauty School Dropout. Uh, many of the cast are local. Four of them are graduates from uh, Young Artists Ensemble. We're very proud of them here in Thousand Oaks. Uh, so I really am very, very honored to introduce to you our musical director, David O, and the cast of Grease. <laughs> Oh, baby, 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 baby,
We hope we've provided you with the musical highlight of your evening. And I want to thank the cast, and I want to thank you for giving us so much of your time. Have a great night, and we'll see you all right next door uh, at Greece, April 12th through the 21st. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Well done. Well done to the cast. Thank you. All right, and um, after all this musical excitement, we now have public comments. Madam Clerk. This is the time and place for public comments. The speaker card is available for those wishing to address the City Council regarding items on the agenda or on a subject within the City's jurisdiction. Speakers for public hearing items shall be called and heard during the public hearing. All remarks should be addressed to the Council as a whole and all documents for City Council and the official record should be presented to the City Clerk prior to speaking. Speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. Under state law, public comment matters may not be considered by the council unless listed on the agenda, but may be referred to the city manager for administrative follow-up. Five people have presented cards and pursuant to council standards, speakers are allowed three minutes. The yellow light displays when you have one minute remaining. Thank you very much. I will call the first three speakers. Jaina Cavell, followed by Clara Knopfler and Richard Elsley. Hi, Gina. Hi. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members, City Staff, and Visitors. I'm Jana Covell, and I am Chair of the City's Arbor Day Earth Day Committee. And we are gearing up for the big event on Saturday, April 13th, from 11 to 4 at Canal Creek Park. This is our 16th annual Arbor Day Earth Day, because we combine Arbor Day and Earth Day in Thousand Oaks because of all our oak trees. We have to do that. <laughs> We even have free trees and plants there to give away. We have close to 100 vendors and exhibitors this year. We have animal shows by Nature of Wild Works. We have the Glen Garvin Bike Rodeo. And we have bike valet service for any families that are riding their bikes to the event. You have free valet service. Park your bike and go visit the event. We have lots of children's activities, a full lineup of entertainment. Um, and it basically, it's a big event for everyone to come and learn to go green in a family fun environment. Um, we also, or I want to say, we, this event is presented by the city and the Caneo Rec and Park District, which is celebrating their 50th anniversary this year, and they're going to have a huge rainforest booth. So be sure and visit that while you're there, too, because that's going to be a lot of fun. And our sponsors this year are Whole Foods, Waste Management, Ventura County Star, Agriman, and KCLU. And for more information, go to the city's website, toaks.org slash go green. And we hope to see you all Saturday at Canal Creek Park. Thank you. Thank you, Jaina Covell. Next up, we have Clara Knopfler, Richard Elsley, and Rondi Guthrie. Good evening, Mrs. Knopfler. And it's quite uh, an honor to have you here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh. This one was for taller people than I am. Thank you very much for helping me to fulfill my mission, my duty as a survivor of Holocaust, the worst genocide of mankind. My mission is to remind and to honor every year days of remembrance to teach and help people to never forget to never let this happen again what happened in 1945 with my family and six million six million people who were killed just because they had a different religion I speak and I, I try to teach I, with my best English. I'm a French and Latin teacher, but my cause is so important that whenever I am invited to speak about my Holocaust experiences, I'm ready to teach that we can live and we can coexist together 
if we respect the differences, there are differences between people, among people, but I believe in coexistence. If we respect their, the differences and follow the good and not the bad, to be an upstander when somebody is down and to be a, not a bystander when you can help and can interfere in the better in a better way. I live now in a community in Thousand Oaks and for three or four years I speak every year with the help of the mayor and I have here a village view of my community in which we declare and we have the proclamation of Mayor Jackie Irwin from last year and the year before. And I would like you to look at the little village view. How important is that? We should, we should continue to remember and never let this happen again. To fight against hatred among people, against prejudice, against um, everything that is injustice. And stick together. Don't be a bystander. Just keep up remembering. From my past is only one thing, 39 members of my family, only my mother and I survived. She lived in my house till 101, and she instilled in me to fight, to teach, any occasion, any opportunity when they listen to me. Never forget and never let this happen again. She instilled in me to write a book. I don't know if your Latin knows scripta manent verba volant. The script stays and the words fly. She said, write a book. I did write a book. I went back to Auschwitz 50 years after the Holocaust happened, 50 years to face my nightmares. And then I started to write the book. The book is, I'm still here, my mother's voice. I try to continue my conviction of never forget. If you are so kind, look at the village view. I had five copies only that I would like to uh, repeat. The city of Thousand Oaks observed the Day of Remembrance. Last year, Mayor Jackie Irwin proclamation included these reminders to all of us. The history of the Holocaust offers an opportunity to reflect on moral responsibilities of individuals, societies, and government. And as a nation and community, we should always remember the terrible events of the Holocaust and remain vigilant against hatred, persecution, and tyranny. This is my, I, I accepted this dearly and it's in my house and I will follow always. As you see, there is a statue there that is the name Remembrance. It's in my house. The original is in the Museum of Holocaust in Washington. Shows a picture of many, many people who were killed and, and hit by one Nazi. But there is one who survives and carries the torch to never forget and remember. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to me and for helping me to carry on this duty forever, as long as I live. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Knopfler. And um, the event that you are um, promoting is taking place Thursday, April 11th at 11.30 at CLU Samuelson Chapel? It, yes, yes. Okay, and yes. perhaps we can, although we only have two days left, perhaps we can post it on the city's website. At 11.25. At 11.25. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I'm extremely grateful for your being here tonight, you being here tonight, and uh, um, for standing up.
um, and being a voice, and especially more than 60 years after the Holocaust, who would have thought that a mission such as yours is still so vitally important in this day and age when we have genocide going on in other parts of the world? Thank and you very much. And still a lot of denial. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Dr. Richard Elsley, followed by Rondi Guthrie, and Nick Kidway. Madam Mayor, Council Members, City Staff, and the community. I'm Dr. Richard Elsley, AKA Dr. Discovery. I'm a resident of Thousand Oaks, and I'm here tonight to tell you about the next talk in the Discovery Center's Science Speaker Series. There is so much scientific research going on around us today that affects our lives, and so it's a good idea for us to be familiar with some of it. In the Speaker Series, we bring in scientists who are doing cutting edge work, but who can explain what they're doing in a way that anybody can understand and enjoy. The next talk is going to be two days from now, April 11th, right here in the Shear Forum at 7.30 p.m. The title is Jean-Michel Cousteau's Crusade to Save the Oceans. And for TOTV, I have a slide up on the projector here. Jean-Michel Cousteau is the son of the pioneering oceanographer Jacques Cousteau, and he runs an organization called the Ocean Futures Society that's headquartered right up in Santa Barbara. The speaker is going to be his second-in-command, Holly Loheis, who is a very enthusiastic, dynamic speaker. So this should be really good. So that's Thursday, April 11th, 7.30 p.m. here. Tickets for adults are $15, children, students, Teachers, seniors, $10. You can get them at the Civic Arts Plaza box office or online at Ticketmaster.com. For more information, sciencespeakerseries.org on the web or 805-905-8168. Are there any questions? Thank you very Thank you. much, Dr. Elsley. Uh, we have now Rondi Guthrie and Nick Kidway. Good evening, Mayor Bill De La Pena, members of the council. My name is Rondi Guthrie, and I am here this evening on behalf of Crown Disposal. I wanted to just make a few comments about the draft solid waste uh, rate study that was released a few weeks ago. I know this item is agendized, um, I believe, for your next meeting on April 23rd, but I wanted to give you a precursor of our comments tonight. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the council again for taking a good hard look at these contracts and making the decision to not automatically extend these contracts last June. By initiating this rate study, you are able to see just how much we pay for trash in Thousand Oaks and how an open RFP process will ensure you are getting the best rates, services, and recycling programs. The first point I would like to highlight from the report is uh, one, cities that contract through a competitive bidding process have lower prices than Thousand Oaks. It should be noted that by just voting not to automatically extend the existing contracts, the city was offered numerous concessions by your existing haulers. The very idea of introducing competition to the marketplace resulted in better rates and services for the city. An open and competitive RFP process for solid waste services will give the city, ratepayers, and businesses even lower rates, better services, and higher recycling standards. Number two, the Ventura County cities that have even higher rates than Thousand Oaks use the same two haulers and have not taken advantage of a competitive bidding process. As we've noted, there has been very little, if any, competition in the solid waste industry in Ventura County for over 30 years, and this has resulted in higher rates and reduced services. The only Ventura County city that has gone out to bid, Santa Paula, has the lowest rates in the county. An open, transparent RFP process will ensure Thousand Oaks is realizing the market realities of today. Number three, there is no incentive for existing haulers to provide emerging and innovative services such as food waste recycling. Food waste recycling should not be included as a pilot program or at an additional cost. Food waste recycling should be considered a customary service and included in the cost of providing solid waste services. And last, significant savings can be realized in both commercial and residential rates. Cities in the report with competitive bid pricing have residential rates up to 28% less and commercial rates are significantly less across the board. 
Thousand Oaks residents and business owners deserve the opportunity to pay less for solid waste services. The city took the responsible first step in gathering information on the solid waste rates and services being provided in Thousand Oaks and seeing how they compare to a competitive marketplace. The HF&H report very clearly states the city will see reduced costs if it moves forward with an RFP process. We would encourage the city to conduct business in a way that ensures one of the largest contracts in the city is open to a competitive bidding process. This is certainly the norm in most all Southern California cities outside of Ventura County and is certain to provide reduced rates, better services, and the most innovative recycling standards. I would also encourage any residents and businesses who would like to see a competitive bidding process and lower trash rates to come to the meeting um, on April 23rd. We will be providing you with these written uh, comments and any additional comments we have between now and then and look forward to the discussion on April 23rd. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Guthrie. Our final speaker is Nick Kidway. I begin in the name of God, who is most beneficial, most merciful. My name is Nick Iqbal Kidwa. I'm resident of Newberry Park. And last time I checked, uh, Mr. Price, still director of Concerned Citizens of Thousand Oaks, especially in these days when uh, public participation is so low. Uh, regarding solid waste, uh, I don't know if the citizens know that uh, we've had a tax increase. And uh, in fact, when I got involved 20 years ago, we used to clean the streets every week. And uh, it went to once a month. Ag and I made a, we were upset about that. And now uh, they are cleaned, I think, twice a month or once a month, I don't know. But $3 a month uh, has been added to our, tra our uh, tra trash or solid waste rates. And uh, that's just one of the ways that the city uh, uh, kind of takes advantage of the citizens uh, without having public hearings or even uh, notification. It's also interesting that, uh, you know, the f if you speak about the Holocaust, you can speak here for five and a half minutes. Uh, but if you come here to complain, it's uh, three minutes uh, changed by Mr. Fox. And it used to be, uh, if you had five speakers, you got five minutes. And that's a civilized way to speak. I would like uh, TOTV to show my first uh, overhead. There it is. Uh, council sets the policy. Uh, tomorrow at uh, 3 o'clock, there is a Hooters hearing right here. And we are paying... I, that's one of the reasons I got rid of uh, Fios TV, you know, five bucks a month for cable TV. And everything is set here uh, in s September of 2011 tw when we had the hearing, the, c the cameras were off. Don't stay quiet and just be nicely dressed. Make a motion that this should be turned on. In fact, uh, you should set the policy. There's a letter from uh, TOTV, TV, there's a letter from uh, City Manager Emeritus, Mr. Brimhall saying that the bureaucrats cannot act on it. This is from July of 2011. Uh, you should really, and Larry Horner, who is a mayor of 10 years, I mean, that's what he said also, is that uh, this should not be heard at the lower level. It should be heard by the city council and let the chips fall where it is. I mean, we live with the votes, but this is completely irresponsible and disgusting, what you're doing. There's my Christian friend from July. Uh, uh, I'll just read a little bit. Praise, glory be to Jesus. I beseech thee to vote against the Hooter coming to T.O. And then it goes on about how the morals have been degraded. It's interesting that on this issue, we have the Christian uh, nice folks as well as uh, women's liber liberation people both coming together to stop it. And people think, well, it has been nice. I mean, there's very few calls. But once they get the liquor, you have the women, the, the contests, just Google Hooters fights, Hooker, Hooters uh, uh, knifing, oh no, and you'll get the hits and uh, it happened in, Newberry, in Glendale, uh, and Burbank and Long Beach. Please take action, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kidwai. We will now move into closed session for approximately five minutes and we'll be right back and the city attorney, Ms. Tracy Noonan, will make the announcement. Yes, we have two closed session matters. Uh, they're both conference with legal counsel for existing litigation. First one is Castro versus City of Thousand Oaks, case number 56, 2013, 00432039, pursuant to government code section 54956.9A. And the second existing litigation matters, Brito versus City of Thousand Oaks, case number 56, 2013, 00432892, pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9A.
website, in their mailers, in their emails, that the city does in fact have a preference program for local businesses. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to see that happening, and I would urge local businesses to take advantage of it. Um, it, it basically means that we take the lowest bid, but if you're a local business, you can be 5% be above that lowest bid and still get the job. So think about uh, applying to, uh, to uh, work with the city, and who would they uh, contact, Mr. Mitnick? Hey, Hader Alawami, our, uh, our uh, business development officer, would we'll be happy to talk to you about that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I will call Mr. Nick Kidwai for the consent calendar before we move to approve. Hi, uh, Nick Kidwai, resident of Newberry Park, director concerned citizens of Thousand Oaks. Uh, uh, I guess there was not much deliberation in that closed session. I'm glad that it was quick. Thank you very much. Uh, the minutes, as usual, are un-American, uh, and we have a 8-0 against residents, which is fine, I guess. Uh, if TOTV can show number D, which is uh, the Helaco, I don't know how to pronounce the super one, letter that the mayor will be sending. Uh, this is, uh, the red is just in my writing to show this is uh, what is proposed. Uh, I, for the life of me, cannot understand why, I mean, we want to get involved in all these uh, uh, tertiary issues when the city has so many problems, especially budgetary problems. Uh, you have no time. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, this is done in the city manager's office where the mayor uh, says, well, this is what I want to talk about without a vote of the council and, or it's done uh, unofficially uh, to write uh, a letter, uh, which I think is a, is a, is a commendable thing. I, I, I support it. I, I've driven in that area many times as uh, I had some customers, so it does need remediation. But uh, uh, other important issues uh, like Hooters, it, or even the issues that you talk about over here, it's a complete silence. I mean, that's why my tie from 2006, here no evil see, no, no rich citizen, still applies. I cannot ret retire it. Uh, regarding H, which is the, was a big hullabaloo in the, in the past, and I have followed it for 15 years, uh, the city taking uh, education money and having uh, ch child care which was and is a very good, noble cause, except except uh, there was uh, some kind of uh, issue about five years ago when a wonderful lady was fired uh, by this body and then the program given over to the uh, Kane Valley Unified District. I did read uh, the report and I have one question. I hope uh, it will be answered. The staff like to answer it, uh, but uh, this is interesting. It says TOTV. I wish I could use it. Right? Not for citizens. Uh, is that uh, there's a hundred and twenty dollar that the city was still spending. What is it? A red light? What happened? Oh, it's the lights are not on? Okay, well, I'm almost done, but basically, is that a hundred and twenty thousand was provided by uh, in janitorial service under this contract, and the contract is going away. So I'm just curious if this is going to be an increase uh, in uh, the taxes uh, for the Canaveral Unified School District and the low-income kids. Uh, are we still going to provide the uh, janitorial service? I, would, uh, I wrote to the school board and uh, they also dodged the issue. I don't know why. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kidd. Why? I'm sorry I did not notice that the clock hadn't started. Um, any, any comments regarding the speaker? No, from staff. All right. Then I'll look for a motion to approve consent calendar. Mr. Adam? Yeah, move the consent calendar. Please vote. The motion carries 5-0, and the ordinance title for item I is an ordinance amending the municipal code relating to zoning maps and changes in zoning classification of property located west side of two Road at Ramona Drive, Z 2011-70412. Uh, 
Thank you. We now move to a public hearing, item 8A, which is an appeal of a unanimous planning commission decision. And um, we will have the city clerk open the hearing. Hearing advertised as required by law is open to consider agenda item 8A, an appeal of the planning commission decision that denied precise plan of design, PPD 2011-70270, Request to retain unpermitted grading and construction within a natural slope area exceeding 25% gradient. Located 4257 Arrowhead Circle, the applicant appellant is Raj Batia. A speaker card is available for those wishing to address the city council regarding this hearing. Uh, speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. We have four people who have presented cards and pursuant to council standards. The applicant appellant is allowed 15 minutes with a five minute rebuttal and the remaining speakers are allowed five minutes each. Thank you and I, for the record, will mention that our supplemental packet has four memos of um, ex parte communications with the applicant, four council members met with the applicant and or his attorney. All right, um, Stephen Kearns, Senior Planner. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. As mentioned, the item before you is an appeal of a Planning Commission decision that denied a uh, request for retention of slope modifications for a residential property at 4257 Arrowhead Circle uh, within the North Ranch area. The request is uh, seeking reversal of that decision um, that denied retention of Certain encroachments, including creating activity, uh, installation of a series of concrete stairs, retaining walls, um, three deck areas uh, with, um, for the uh, PPD 2011-70270. Uh, this slide shows an aerial photograph of the property. It's at the terminus of Arrowhead Circle. Uh, at the end of the bulb, the red line depicts the property lines. and if you follow the mouse cursor, um, this area here is the area that we're looking at tonight. As a brief background for the project, um, in September of 1975, the Planning Commission considered this subject development site, the track 2343 and its associated plan development permit, RPD 75136, as well as the corresponding environmental impact report. Um, at that meeting, the, the commission did not certify the EIR due to uh, concerns over the environmental impacts, particularly the, the grid, amount of grading activity. Lot 30, which is the subject property, was identified as one of the more critical lots. Um, since the EIR was not certified that night, there was no action taken on the tract or the RPD. In January of 1976, the Planning Commission Consider the revised plans, which involve new development configuration and deletion of 21 lots. This revised plan uh, eliminated a lot of grading activity, and um, lot, one of th lot 30, the subject lot, was not one of the lots that were eliminated from the 317 originally proposed um, as part of the reduction of 296 lots. In April of 2011, the city was notified that work was occurring in the slope area and investigated the report as a result, the building department issued a stop work order. Um, however, the work continued, and subsequently, notice of uh, violation was sent out from our city code compliance division. The applicant then submitted the subject application, and in November, the application was found complete for processing. Uh, at that time, the project had not been approved by the Homeowners Association. Um, this photo. Uh, is a modification of the area as the viewed from the pad, the backyard, looking up slope to, uh, easterly, and the concrete stairs accessing the upper uh, pad areas are shown here. This is a northerly upslope perspective looking towards the middle. Uh, the large deck area is in this general area. This is looking northwesterly. And then this slide shows the extent of the work, and this is the lower deck area in this general area. This slide uh, 
There's a photograph of the concrete stairs um, and the easterly portion of the property uh, with this handrail. It transitions to a walkway, which goes up to another series of stairs that, that then transitions to the main deck, uh, which is a little over 1,300 square feet and is installed with 12, 12 uh, by 12 concrete pavers and are held laterally in place by these concrete bands shown here. This is a, a photograph of the upper terrace, which is about 60 square feet. Um, you can see there's additional stairs and portions of the retaining wall that were installed. And then this is a pathway that serves or accesses the lower deck from the main deck, and this is uh, the lower deck. This is a photograph taken from the center of the bowl but the, on Arrowhead Circle. As you can see, you can't see the slope area from, uh, from the streetscape perspective due to the, well, the existing homes as well as this large oak tree in front of the house. This photograph was taken from the small upper terrace. Uh, and as you can see, um, you can't see any properties across the streets. So there's no vantage in the neighboring, uh, neighboring homes across the way. Uh, this is the oak tree that was in the foreground of the previous picture. This is a vantage point from the main terrace looking southeasterly towards the neighbor's property. Um, due to the existence of mature landscape, there's no visibility in the neighbor's property. And then this is a photo that is towards the neighbor to the west, and uh, due to their landscaping, the only visible portion of their home is the, their ridge line of their, of their roof. This exhibit demonstrates the modifications in relation to the natural slope and as well as the created pad area. Um, as you'll note, all the improvements are outside the originally created pad area and, um, and the approved development area. So all of it is within natural sloping terrain greater than 25% slope. In 2012, the application to allow retention of the grading activity was considered by the Planning Commission, and at its September 24th meeting, the Commission unanimously denied with a 5-0 vote the request primarily due to being inconsistent with the underlying plan development permit. On October 1st, uh, the applicant submitted the application to appeal, and then subsequent to the Planning Commission decision, the HOA uh, approved the project as it's in its uh, existing condition. Uh, the city's 25% slope grading policy, um, the general plan, which establishes the policies, discourages grading in slopes greater than 25% gradient. The goals and policies of the general plan state that there should be no grading in slopes over 25% natural grade. Uh, as a tool to implement that, the municipal code adopts section 7-3.07, which requires approval from a planning commission or a city council for any encroachment for grading activity within 25% or greater natural slope. The applicant is asking city council to reverse the planning commission's decision and allow retention of the improvements as they are in their existing condition, which involves uh, grading activity and um, a certain amount of construction with the natural terrain. The appellant has provided seven statements of their appeal. Uh, the first one is that the approval will not establish a precedent for 25% slope encroachments since other encroachments have been granted and that the improvements are not visible from the public that since the slope is not visible to the public and is a brush clearance area, um, that this slope is unique, that the area is not pristine, untouched, natural open space, but has previously been cleared of brush and planted by previous owners, so it's, and it's not part of any public trail system, and that the improvements would allow reasonable conforming use of the property since it is not an active recreational amenity, contains no structures, and other properties have been granted similar requests. The 
appellant does not believe that approval will result in overdevelopment of, of the site since the work is flat and a significant portion of the hillside is retained. And they believe that the improvements will enhance the site and be compatible with the residents. And that if the city elects to approve it, that it will be consistent with the property owners association's approval. Uh, in response to the, sta uh, the appellant's statements, uh, staff's response are that staff believes that approval was set precedent for this specific development area. And the intent of the slope area is since there are nine other lots on the same street with uh, similar lot configurations that are subject to the same development restrictions. Staff does not believe that since each development area has its own development standards that it was set a citywide develop, uh, precedent. Um, as noted in the Planning Commission's finding, there are no unique circumstances related to the property that would justify de a deviation from the standards. And that the subject hillside was not created as part of any permitted action by the city. And the only modifications to the slope appear to be a result of previous property owners and the modifications made by the applicant. Now, staff concurs that, that the, with the appellant that the hillside does not contain any public trail system, nor is the hillside visible from any public perspective. Um, it is staff's and the planning commission's position that since the applicant has usable yard area in the excess of the minimum standards uh, where 1,600 square feet is required of usable recreational area, 2,900 square feet is provided. So the applicant has reasonable use, reasonable use of the property and um, area for recreational amenities. Um, there have been no other permits granted for encroachment natural sloping terrain greater than 25% within this development area. And that although the amount of encroachment is relatively, relatively minimal, about 10% of the slope area, the introduction of any improvements that can be used for active recreational purposes are inconsistent with the intent of this area. <laughs> Staff believes that the improvements detract, not enhance, from the uh, from the purpose of the hillside, which is to provide a natural transition from the built environment to the, to the natural environment. And staff agrees the applicant has attained conditional approval from the Homeowners Association and that if City Council elects to approve the project subject to the conditions attached to the Planning Commission report, report that the two approvals would be consistent. Uh, staff is therefore recommending denial of the appeal and uphold the Planning Commission's decision. However, if City Council elects to grant the appeal, uh, Council will need to make findings to support that decision, and staff would recommend approving the, the project subject to the conditions contained in the Planning Commission staff report. And this concludes staff's introduction. Staff's available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Kearns. Are there any questions of Mr. Kearns? Mrs. Irwin. How long ago was this ordinance put into effect? It goes back to the early 70s. Thank you. Mr. Adam. Uh, thank you. Hello, Mr. Kearns. The Westlake North Property Owners Association, in their letter of uh, approval, uh, listed some deed restrictions, no permanent structures, uh, no lighting, no barbecue, no fire pits, landscaping along the west side. But I believe in the staff report it said that the staff, in the event of an approval of the PO, would make, make the conditions even more restrictive. And I'm assu assuming that has to do with condition six, where the staff would recommend not only no permanent structures, but no temporary as well. Do I get that right? Staff, staff's condition or the recommended condition attached to the Planning Commission report is more restrictive than the language contained in the HOA approval. Um, the way the language was crafted for the Planning Commission was that no structure whatsoever, above ground structure, would be allowed up on this deck area. And the intent was to maintain a passive recreational amenity as opposed to having um, 
facilities up there that could lend itself to active recreation. Okay. Well, what what would be? I mean, in the event of a uh, approval of the appeal, what would be allowed up there? In as far as staff would be concerned. Well, the way the condition was was worded, um, it is fairly restrictive. So it would allow no structures whatsoever. So it'd be basically, you know, an area for um, and for access to the slope, or you know, but no structures whatsoever. The way it's worded. I mean, could you have a chair? No, yeah, no structure at all. So um, no chair. Yeah, yeah, no chair. Okay, got it. All right. Um, in the event of a denial of the appeal, what what will that mean to the Batias? What's the city going to expect to happen up there? If the project was denied, they would have to perform remedial action to the slope to return it to its the most recent approved grading plan for this property. So there'd be. Um, geotechnical reports prepared and submittals to our public works department for grading permits to perform that action and it, there'd be an inspection process sub, sub, subsequent to that. So you ha basically have to tear everything out? Right. Okay. And uh, just, oh, um, on page 42, uh, number 12, I think the staff has in here, you know, in the event of an approval of the appeal, lighting restriction. Uh, it says something about uh, low profile, low voltage landscape lighting would seemingly would be okay, but uh, are you sure you would want that in there? Because the property owners association is saying, I believe no lighting at all. Well, it, we, that's a suggested condition from staff. Uh, the idea was to provide uh, or allow for low voltage, something that would not require an electrical permit that can be installed like Malibu lights. Um, to provide safe access up to the sloping terrain area. Oh, I see. Hmm, like lighting the trails right. going up. I, I see. Okay. How do you feel about lighting up there on the terrace? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think uh, any lighting should be installed up on, the, up on the terrace area. It should be just for the access points up to the top. All right. For safe access to the hillside. Okay, that's what I'm getting at, because it seems like the POA is saying no lighting up there, but I, this seemed a little like you and the, you and the Property Owners Association were uh, at odds on that, but I guess what you're saying is just safety lighting to get up, up and down the steps. Yeah? That's, that's correct. Okay. Hey, thank you very much. Mr. Fox. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, looking at the staff report, I didn't see anything with respect to safety concerns in the areas where the grading occurred without a permit and the retaining walls were placed. Is that correct? The staff report doesn't address any of the safety concerns. There right. was, there was Are there any up. safety concerns? No, not even. Good evening, Council. Anadar Hidari, Public Works Department. Um, at this more preliminary stage that we're at, prior to uh, the benefit of a permit being issued on the property and inspections occurring, since that didn't happen, we cannot really ascertain to the fullest extent uh, <clears throat> the extent of the stability or the uh, grading that has occurred. But what would happen is, should the project be approved, that uh, we would ensure that the property, that the, that the improvements meet all the requirements with geotechnical and civil engineering uh, considerations prior to final acceptance. So uh, okay. as an overall, do we uh, believe that the hill is compromised as a result of these kind of moderately, you know, uh, improvements? Uh, not necessarily. It doesn't, there's no indication of any uh, stability uh, issues. Okay. I would agree with that. I just want to get that on the record. So no safety issues. Uh, the second issue is would it be fair for the council to assume that the uh, staff uh, denial, recommend, I'm assuming it was recommended to be denied at the Planning Commission. That's, that's I think it's in the report. And then, of course, the commission denied at 5-0 is based solely on uh, aesthetics and current city policy. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And it's also part of the record that as far as aesthetics are concerned, you virtually cannot see this property other than the property owner from the backyard. That is correct as well. So from an aesthetic standpoint, 
to anybody else other than the property owner, it is moot because you can't see the property. You'd, you'd literally need a helicopter to look into this property. That's correct for this individual property. Right. Uh, so in terms of aesthetic impacts, there are none because you can't see it. Not for this property. What we were looking at was the cumulative effect. It I get have. that. I get that. I, and uh, just for the record, um, uh, I don't think, at least speaking for myself, I, I completely get why the Planning Commission arrived at the decision they did because their uh, review of this has to be applied to current city policy. Uh, and their latitude, I think, is a little bit different than the council. So uh, I certainly understand why this is here. I think that's another discussion down the road whether some of these issues that we're dealing with in 19 or 2013 uh, when we're dealing with things in 1975 really need to come to the council now. But that, I think that's a separate question. So no safety issues. Basically, the recommendation and the decision of the Planning Commission is based on current city policy and aesthetic concerns. And as far as aesthetic concerns, it's a part of the record that you simply can't see the property from anywhere other than the homeowner's backyard. Is that fair enough? That sums it up. Yep. Okay. Thanks very much. Any additional questions of staff? I do have a question, Mr. Kearns. You mentioned in one of the slides that the issue, the city issued a stop work order, but the work continued. It wasn't quite worded that way in the staff report, and I was wondering whether in your presentation tonight, whether the work continued in defiance of the stop work order or, or how, what, what happened there? Did they not receive the stop work order and just continued? Can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, there was a, a billing department stop work order issued in April of 2011. And then as a follow-up to that, a week later, the Public Works Department issued a stop work order and advised the homeowners to get a grading permit for the work that was occurring to the slope. Um, subsequently, we received another complaint, and our Code Compliance Division sent out a notice of violation in May of that year. And then another one was followed up a month later. And after that second notice from our Code Compliance Division, the applicant came in and submitted their, this application. And during that time, the grading or the work continued? We're not... Well, I'm not sure exactly what, at what phase the work was at. It could have been completed at the initial stop work, and then we are seeking um, compliance with the permit process at that point, so we are following up and asking them to come in and get, uh, obtain the necessary permits. So this, how far along they were with the initial stop work, uh, I'm not certain. Okay, and the HOA that eventually approved this just recently is also the same HOA that filed a complaint with the Code Enforcement Department, correct? They're the same HOA that opposed the project to the Planning Commission. Right? Okay. All right. Any additional questions? Good. Uh, we do have now Attorney Tom Cohen representing the applicant, Mr. Batia. And you have 15 minutes, Mr. Cohen, to make your case. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, council members, my name is Tom Cohen. I'm with Alston and Bird. I'm here on behalf of Mr. and Mrs. Batia. Also uh, available uh, to speak if you have questions on technical issues is uh, civil engineer uh, Don Waite and uh, Soils and Geotech Engineer, uh, Mr. Masood Rana. Thank you to staff. Thank you to you all for listening to us tonight. I wanted to make sure that our letter submitted on Friday, April 5th, uh, has been uh, received and reviewed and is made a part of the administrative record. I, I believe I saw it in the supplemental packet, so I'm assuming that it's a part of the record. We come to you uh, with our hat in hand um, we apologize that we're here asking for your approval after the backyard improvements have already been constructed. That is not the normal course, and we know that. And clearly a mistake was made, but I don't believe that the actions were intentional to avoid. What I know is that the Batias did obtain the necessary permits for the work that was done at the base of their slope. You can see on this slide 
the, the fountain and the walls continue in both a westerly and a, 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 an easterly direction. And uh, there was some soil taken out, and that is part of a manufactured slope area that uh, on a slide that you saw earlier from Mr. Kearns. The Batias did evaluate, um, with the civil engineer's assistance, uh, the work that they wanted to do at, at the uh, midway or the, near the top of the slope. Uh, they looked at the codes and they wrongly concluded that permits were not required. Um, this wasn't, as I said, done to avoid permits. It was an error. Uh, all the hardscape was completed and a good portion of the landscaping had already been planted when my clients did in fact receive the stop work order. They had pallets of plant material in their driveway that still had to be planted. It's the small small plants and shrubs. Uh, the major, bigger pieces had already been installed because they had to have equipment to get that up on the slope. Uh, but the fact is that all the heavy uh, work had already been completed. We respect and understand the city's grading policies in slopes greater than 25% terrain. And they're there to prevent erosion and to preserve aesthetics. The rationale for the 1975 RPD and track restrictions on grading made perfect sense then, when it was a brand new development with no landscaping to screen the hillsides and slopes. There was a, a big concern in all, many projects throughout the city that scarifying the hillsides was uh, important to avoid. However, we've now had almost 40 years uh, that passed since the track was built. The area has matured with large trees and landscaping. It's beautiful over there if you haven't seen it. Uh, and the slopes are not visible, as they may have been when the project was first conceived and then graded. Today, a sensible approach would be to evaluate backyard improvements in 25% terrain on a case-by-case -case basis to consider whether the slopes are visible to the public and the neighbors and whether the slope is safe. It's incongruous to evaluate these types of applications based on facts that existed when a development project was first built, when there was real uh, concern about visible scarring of the hillsides. From a practical perspective, most homeowners would have no idea that these policies affect them as it relates to improvements in their backyard, regardless if the improvements are on a backyard slope. If the Homeowners Association approves it in the mind of homeowners, they've met their burden. Now, the Homeowners Association in this case approved it after the fact. Slope stability and safety is of prime concern to our clients, as they certainly want to make sure that their valued investment is not harmed or at risk of damage, and that they do not endanger their neighbor's properties. A civil engineer, as I mentioned earlier, was involved from the beginning before the work was done, and a civil engineer engaged after the fact to peer review the prior civil engineer's work. Mr. Waite and Mr. Rana must demonstrate to city staff, and you heard it from Nodder, that the slope is safe and uh, with the improvements made by the Batias. So there's work still to be done. And city staff must be satisfied prior to issuing these after the fact permits. Uh, I, I haven't been going through the slides, and I don't think I'm going to. Um, I wanted to mention that, uh, uh, and Mr. Fox mentioned this already, that the improvements are not seen from the public way or our neighbors' homes. And we know that the city's policy is intended to preserve the visual and aesthetic values of our hillsides and open space. Um, the Batias do have a 42-foot by 220-foot 24 foot wide band of land at the top of the slope that is in a restricted use area. It is roughly 9,400 square feet of land area that's untouched, pristine natural open space, and it will remain that way. 90% of the remaining slope area outside of the restricted use area is largely untouched by these improvements. It's also important to note that this slope is not outside of the restricted use area is not pristine natural open space. They have to conduct annual brush clearance to satisfy the fire department. It's not in a restricted use area. Also, uh, just as a, as a um, note to the file, uh, the, the larger of the three patios 
was constructed in an area that appears to have been previously lightly graded before the Bhatias purchased their home three and a half years ago. Um, I think th that lent them uh, believe that that area was not an area that required grading and that's why they didn't get a grading permit. Uh, the conditions that have been uh, uh, recommended or that are part of the approval by the uh, Westlake North Property Owners Association are conditions that we accept and that we will comply with. Uh, the condition in the staff report, when I heard, would not include chairs, uh, the, uh, my alarm bells went off. This is an area for contemplative, meditative activity. It's not an area for raucous parties. There's not going to be a barbecue. There's not going to be a fire pit. But they want to be able to have a chaise lounge and a chair so they can sit up there and read quietly and enjoy the views. We also believe that by approving the application, we're not setting a precedent. While the RPD and track conditions are specific to this lot and others within the tract, most if not all development in our city built in or adjacent to similar terrain have similar conditions. And there are a number of projects approved in North Ranch long after the tracks were first approved and built that allowed for encroachment into 25% terrain, including the recent Walsh family backyard expansion on Lakeview Canyon Road. Another project within the same tract as the Batias on Crest Haven was approved in 2007 for encroachment into 25% terrain. Thus, there are tangible examples where the policy concerns of the grading ordinance were addressed, and we believe we have done the same in this case. So we respectfully ask for uh, your approval tonight of our, uh, our backyard improvements, and I'm available to respond to questions. Um, or we'll direct them to the appropriate consultant. Thank you for your time and uh, consideration. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. We have someone here by the name of Masood Rana. Is he here? Uh, Mr. He... Uh, Masood Rana and Don Wade are the consultants. and but Engineers? Both engineers. Okay. One is a civil engineer, the other is a soils and geotech. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions of Mr. Cohen, Mr. Mrs. Irwin? Actually, this question for you, uh, it could be staff also. Are there penalties? I mean, obviously, we want people to pull permits before they do these projects to make sure there is no visual impact and to make sure there's no um, uh, slope instability. So does the city, are there, are there penalty fees for your client? I'm not aware of any penalties in the, in the code that would be applicable here. I would suggest you ask staff because I don't know. I, yeah. I can I can answer Go that ahead. question. Um, as as you know, we have the code enforcement process. If if we receive a complaint that something was done without permits, we initiate a code enforcement process, which is what uh, Mr. Kearns explained. Um, historically, the philosophy, however, is to get compliance. So if we do receive a code enforce you know a, a complaint of a unpermitted work, we will open up a code enforcement matter and we will contact the property owner to apply for the appropriate permits. If the property owner um, goes through that permit process, we will hold the code enforcement action in abeyance. If the permits are ultimately obtained, then the code enforcement action won't be proceed anymore because, again, the philosophy of the city council is to get compliance. City council, all, if, they do, if we don't get compliance, then we have the option of filing, uh, filing criminal charges, uh, either as a misdemeanor or an infraction. City council or the city code also has a civil assessment program codified in the municipal code um, that allows us to pursue uh, violations on a civil basis as opposed to a criminal basis and fines range from hundred dollars to I think five hundred dollars um, but similar to the code enforcement matter uh, to, a, to a criminal code enforcement matter our municipal code requires that we give notice and opportunity to cure so in this case that's what we did we gave them a notice that they were violating the code because they didn't have appropriate permits and they are trying to cure it by filing the permit application so in this case it wouldn't be appropriate to impose a fine if there is a desire it would not be appropriate because our code specifically gives them an opportunity to cure. Um, I, I would say that if there is a desire to change the philosophy, I would ask that, uh, that the council direct staff to bring this matter back to city council at a future agenda and we can actually discuss the whole code enforcement process and civil assessment process. Because as it stands right now, if an applicant files a permit and goes through that process, we will not pursue either criminal or civil charges against the property owner. So there's really no incentive to pull a permit then? 
Well, yeah, there, there is there. I mean, well, again, we're we're att we're attempting to get people to comply with what the code is. Um, they still would have to apply for the permits, and those can be costly. Um, there is a provision under the building code. If a building permit is required, we can charge more than the original building code permit. And I would ask staff to clarify that because I don't have all the details on that one. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, if. Uh, if work was commenced without a permit, and then later on they're required to come in to get the permit, uh, we do charge a double fee. That's just for the building permits, and in this case, the only <clears throat> uh, work up there that required a building permit was a small retaining wall, so that won't be a significant cost item, I don't think. Any additional questions? Uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it, uh, Mrs. Irwin, because uh, I, too, contacted the city attorney over the weekend to discuss that very same issue, because it's easy to ask for forgiveness after the fact. If there's no penalty involved, then we could set a precedent. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, nonetheless, Mr. Mr. Fox? Yeah, just so anybody watching, before they get the wrong idea, uh, the point is for compliance. However, if you proceed work, would do work without a permit, and the staff determines that that work is unsafe, uh, you're going to tear that out, uh, and you're going to start over again. So uh, just a word to the wise, doing uh, construction work around your home without a permit, if uh, you get a stop work order, and staff can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and it's determined by building and safety that the, it does not meet the code, um, and really the only way to cure it is tear it down and build it again, uh, or pour more concrete or whatever it is, there'll be extra expenses. And in fact, you may have to just replace the whole structure. So it's uh, it's not as easy as it maybe has been portrayed. Is that Ms. correct? Because I, I know in the past, it's we correct. have had people take things down. That's correct. Mrs. Noonan? Yeah, one other, one other option um, in looking at, uh, again, we can either look you know, bring back our code enforcement policies and civil assessment policies for council consideration. Another idea um, is you will be uh, looking at your user fees tonight. Another idea is to impose full cost recovery on those permits that are applied for after the fact, since historically we don't, uh, we don't receive full cost recovery on permits before the fact. So that's something you guys can consider when we get to the user fee staff report. And that is the next cons uh, agenda item, yes. interestingly. Mr. Price. Thank you. Uh, apparently that's a common theme. Uh, I too contacted uh, the city attorney and discussed the uh, penalty issue. I do have one question for Madam City Attorney. Um, when you go the criminal route, if you were to file a criminal, uh, and there is a fine assessed, uh, am I correct in assuming that the majority of that fine goes to the courts and not to the city? That's correct. And if we go through an administrative process, then the city would be the recipient of any fine. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. If, again, if there is a desire by council to change the philosophy, I would ask that it be brought back because there would probably likely be tweaks that we would want to make to our code in and of itself and the policies and procedures. But for this case, again, our code is that we give them notice and opportunity to cure. Understood. And I guess based on the comments of uh, uh, the other council members, that is the desire is to bring it back and discuss that? Well, um, we, 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 we might. Uh, okay. We'll have to put it on the agenda, yes. Mr. Adam, any comments? No comments, okay. Um, no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Thank you. We do have our next speaker, Dr. Sue Bauer. My name is Dr. Sue Bauer, and I live at 4241 Arrowhead Circle in North Ranch, and that's the property westerly adjacent to the subject property in this case. I am here to voice concerns regarding unpermitted modifications to the steep hillside on that property. My concern is visual impact, safety, and stability of the hillside that has been greatly altered as you know, our Homeowners Association originally did not approve the project, stating that the plan submitted did not match what actually had already been constructed on the hillside. 
the homeowners modified their response after, I understand, the attorney for the Bhatias requested that they go back and revisit and consider allowing the modifications. Attorney Cohen's letter to the council and statements that he made here tonight have some inaccuracies and some omissions which I bring to attention. On page two of Attorney Cohen's letter, item two is not totally correct stating that improvements are not visible to the neighbors. Even those images displayed by the planning department are not totally inclusive because if you stand in my backyard, it is very, very visible. And there are at least three neighbors west of my yard that can see that. So I would like to correct those inaccuracies And regarding item three on page two, is there documentation that erosion and safety concerns and measures have been assessed? And are Newman Engineering Associates and Westland Civil Inc. without bias? I understood family members engineered the plans for this project. On page three, item five, does not mention that grading occurred after the Batias moved in, but before the major construction began. As I testified before the Planning Commission, there were hand laborers up there with hand tools leveling off the space that has been claimed tonight was already level. Item eight on page three, the statement that homeowners are not typically aware of rules regarding grading on already developed parcels seems irrelevant and perhaps inane. The homeowners has CCNRs and it provides them. One of the owners of this property is an architect and Mr. Cohen's letter states that the work was done under the supervision of a licensed civil engineer. Finally, I want to ask, is there evidence that the hillside is stable now that the construction is completed? Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Mrs. Bauer. And we have no additional speakers regarding this appeal. I will now direct to staff any, any comments you would like to make regarding issues that were raised by Mrs. Bauer or Mr. Cohen. I just have a couple comments. Um, Ms. Bauer stated that the, the improvements to the slope area are visible from other properties. Um, when staff, staff did not visit any other property besides the applicant's property and from the vantage point of the deck, it didn't appear that the deck was visible from any other property. However, condition number 10 in the suggested conditions requires that landscaping is planted along the applicant's property to provide an additional buffer um, that way the mitigation is not reliant on the neighboring property's landscaping um, for, for privacy. And um, in response, I need to correct a, a comment I made to uh, Council Member Adam regarding the chair being a structure after uh, looking at the code. As long as it's not constructed or erected, it would not be considered a structure. So a chair is exempt from that condition. Any additional comments? Go ahead. And a follow up on the uh, stability concerns. Uh, the staff shares the, the same concern that the homeowner raised and that's why uh, th those issues will be closely scrutinized as we go through, should the project be approved as we go through the uh, grading permit uh, application and, and requirements and, and make sure that it satisfies all city code. So we're being asked to um, by the applicant appellant to approve something that really hasn't been thoroughly tested or checked by city staff. Hmm. Okay. Any additional questions or comments? Okay, let me follow up on my um, question then. What is, uh, should council approve this? What, and you found some 
um, incompatibility with the safety or the, with the construction, I should say, what would happen? Would the homeowner would have to tear everything out and start fresh, or what would happen? Uh, in the extreme example, that could be a possibility if it was determined that uh, at, with some subsequent geotechnical testing of the slope and evaluation, if there was some underlying factor that uh, caused this to uh, be incompatible and, and not, not meet the requirements of the uh, Public Works Department, then those areas and or the entire area may need to be, may be required to be removed and, and restored and reconstructed re, uh, under a uh, you know inspection and an, an alternative mean, so that could be a possibility. Thank you, Mr. Adam. Uh, um, just on the clarification on that, we we, were, we are by no means approving this project as it sits right now. If we were to grant the appeal, what we're approving is that the project go through the permitting process that it should have in the first place. Isn't that correct? Well, you would be approving the entitlement, and that is approving the project. They still have to go through the ministerial steps yeah. of a grading permit and a building permit. All right, but, but it, it would be on the it, basis of those existing improvements and to what degree they met right. city standards on inspection, and they may or may not, in which case they'd have to comply with the city standards that are in the grading ordinance and the building uh, code. All right. So the project... I understand what you're saying, proving the entitlement, but the project itself could be significantly altered based on what is found in the permit process for st slope stability, safety, all these issues that have already been brought up. Yeah, that's right. There could be additional remediation, or if for some reason the okay. slope turned out not to be stable with any grading on it at all, then that's a different matter. All right. Thank you. I, I just I need to con reconfirm one more thing. Um, staff does not know when you issued the first stop work order whether the project was complete or not, whether the grading had already been completed. That's correct. The first stop work order, we were notified of work occurring on the slope and they were given a stop work and directed to come in and obtain the appropriate permits at that point. Um, we don't know what extent the work had, been, um, had occurred at that point. So it could have been completed, it could have been halfway, we just don't know at that, at that moment. The following week, um, Public Works issued the stop work order and asked them to come in and get a grading permit. Um, the inspector at that time said it looked, it appeared that they were just doing landscape work. So you had to, you issued two stop work orders? Uh, from two separate divisions, yes, that's correct. One from Public Works for the grading component and from the billing department for the, the building components. And when you went back, or the inspector went back, the landscaping had already been done? Or when did you go back most recently? Well, the last code action was taken in June of 2011. So that was the last municipal code violation. And then subsequently, the applicant submitted the precise plan design application. And we're going to the, the entitlement phase to seek retention of the project as it's designed. So we're looking for um, approval of the project as it's constructed in its state now. What about the complaint that the grading was different from the plans that were submitted to the HOA? Um, well, the plans that we reviewed, it appears that the grading, the, the plans that we have appear consistent with the work that's been performed out on the site. So um, I don't know if there's anything different than um, what has been shown and what has been what has been built. Thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions of staff, Mr. Cohen, you have five more minutes to rebut. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, Council Members, Tom Cohen, a resident of Thousand Oaks here on behalf of the Batias. Uh, Mr. Rana, the uh, uh, soils and geotech uh, engineer, has looked at the original soils studies that were done on this track back from 1975 and his preliminary uh, indications are that this slope is stable and that it was made more stable by the work that you see in this photograph on your screen, uh, the, the lower retaining walls that were permitted by city, uh, city departments. Um, but we're going to 
walk through all those issues with city staff to make sure uh, that all the I's are, are dotted, all the T's are crossed, that the slope is safe and will remain in place for years to come, as the slope has for the last 40 years. There have been no problems with the slope. It's, it's bedrock. Um, so uh, if you want to hear from Mr. Rana about that, I'm, I'm sure he'd be pleased to come up and talk to you about that. But other than that, I don't have anything further uh, uh, unless you have questions of me. It does not appear so. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Thank you. All right. If there are no additional questions of staff, I will close the public hearing and open it up for discussion and or motion. Mr. Adam. Well, this has got to be a very expensive way <laughs> to get an entitlement for a project. I mean, the moral of the story, as you know, we've heard, is if you're going to build something on your property, check with your homeowners association and the city before you undertake uh, this kind of project. Uh, just, uh, just some reflections on what I've heard tonight. You know, I, don't, I don't think this is a precedent-setting project. I think the city reviews these things on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, and they say so in the staff report. And I also think that the visual impacts are minimal to probably none. I mean, I was up on the site, and it's not visible from the street. As far as the neighbors, uh, the requirement that landscaping be put along the westerly fence, I think, would remedy any visibility there. And, it, and frankly, I'm not sure there's even that much visibility without the landscaping, but that would certainly be a condition that would need to be uh, adhered to. Um, uh, you know, it's passive. What they're recommending is passive use up there. Uh, the chairs would, would, I think, fit with passive use. But certainly, uh, you know, the restrictions that the Property Owners Association has, has requested for no new buildings, structures, lighting, fire pits, I think all that is very relevant. And the, the applicant is willing to go along with that. There's been no encroachment into the restricted use area, which we've had cases where there has been encroachment into the restricted use area, which is a lot more egregious than what I'm seeing tonight. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's my inclination. Uh, oh, oh uh, well, certainly that there's another thing about this condition number 12 about the lighting restrictions. I think staff needs to look at that very closely. Uh, lighting up on that on that terrace uh, would probably be inappropriate. I could see lighting along the walkway, as you suggested, for safety purposes. But you know, it would be my inclination, uh, and albeit it's after the fact, uh, you know that. The, the punishment for the crime to tear everything out doesn't seem to fit. So it would be my inclination to uh, grant the appeal. I understand where the Planning Commission is coming from. And, and as Mr. Fox says, they have a more narrow purview to look at these kind of things. And they also didn't have the benefit of the Property Owners Association letter at the time, which I think has a little bit of weight at this point. But it would be my inclination, and I, and I guess I, could, I will make a motion that we do grant the appeal, uh, and but all the conditions that staff and the property owners associations have, have uh, indicated be adhered to uh, rigid, rigidly for the sake of privacy and the neighbors, and that uh, you know the per permitting process, of course, would go through all the necessary steps to make sure the slope is safe and, uh, and the visibility is minimal to, to none. Thank you. We have a motion, Mrs. Mrs. Irwin. I um, I support the motion. I don't agree at all with the way this project happened, but I can't see that tearing everything out, unless there are safety issues that can't be resolved, is a very um, practical or prudent um, solution to the problem. I think one of the other things that we might need to look at is um, the ordinance that allowed encroachment, that didn't allow encroachment into the 25% um, grade, was an ordinance that was put into effect in 1970. And I think it served us very, very well. But in, um, I mean, look at how beautiful the city is, and we don't have, we don't have a whole lot of hillside development. but. Um, I think that it, in some cases it's become a little impractical and, and when you have a situation where um, you have a, pro a backyard in a very established neighborhood, 
that is um, almost, uh, I mean, completely um, not, I mean, where there are minimal visible impacts to the neighbors. And as long as you test slopes for stability, I'm not sure that we should require homeowners to go all the way up to the city council. It, it, you know, that in itself might discourage homeowners from getting um, these important tests done and getting these permits. I, I think that if we are able to, in a way, look at, you know, very narrowly, there's no visual impact, that's, that the slope stability is not compromised, that if there's a passive use, that we should allow the, um, the staff kind of a little longer leash in approving some of these um, some of these permits. Now, obviously, we can't do that today, but I would hope that the council would at least ask staff to take a look at it. I think it would save homeowners a whole lot of money. And as I said, I, I don't see bringing these type of issues in front of the city council. There are a, a whole lot more uh, 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 illegal structures in that area. And um, obviously, code compliance is not going to go after them unless there's a complaint. But I think that um, we need to be a little bit practical and, and um, see if there's another way of um, dealing with some of these issues. So I would um, ask if you might consider adding that to your motion. Well, um, I think as you said, Councilman Irwin, maybe that would be a separate issue that we'd have to consider this business of 25%. I mean, I think it's a very good point. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure we would want to add that to the motion. Would we? Uh, yeah, I would suggest I, we make that perhaps a different agenda item. Yeah, and in fact, I talked to city manager, and he's indicated that we can bring this back without it, without needing a motion. Yeah, maybe that along with the business of uh, penalties and whatever. But it, it, this whole business brought up a couple of good things that you know we need to consider. Any addition. additional comments? I, I, nope. So you, you can bring back something that, that um, the council could look at separately. I wasn't saying to approve something like that. I was mm -hmm. just saying that it would be, it might be time after all these years to look at, at something like that. Okay. Um, no additional comments regarding the motion? Okay. I will just make a, a, a few comments. I certainly am not in favor of uh, anyone breaking municipal code, not really policy, but an actual municipal code, a law and then ask for forgiveness after the fact. I think we do need to strongly look at imposing a penalty, which we can deal with in the next item, number 9A, the study session, and see if we can double um, or, or at least uh, ask for a full cost recovery of a planning commission hearing as well as a council hearing, and that would be $4,000. And then perhaps m maybe the, the residents would be more inclined to ask for permission first and not afterwards. Uh, uh, having said that, the improvements, it would be foolish in a sense to re have everything removed and restored to its natural slope because the improvements are made and one can only hope that they meet city code and we will find that out as well. I am not one in favor of necessarily going against the unanimous planning commission as well as staff recommendation, but uh, in this case it warrants approving the appeal and uh, and um, supporting the motion with perhaps a message to any homeowner out there. I think we have another case coming up um, to please ask the city first before you violate uh, city code. <laughs> so, um, Mr. Adam, maker of the motion, final comments? No, no, no final comments. Please vote. Mrs. Irwin. I, I, I'm sorry, I just want to ask the city attorney one more thing. Do we need to consider penalties on the next item, or is that something that staff could give us some options and maybe later on we can revise the... The, the actual penalty pro program that we already have in our municipal code would be a separately agendized item. What I was suggesting is in our user fee schedule, you know, we, we have cost, we charge fees for <coughs> various permits, but mm -hmm. we don't usually charge full cost recovery. What I'm suggesting is that we can also look at it in lieu of a civil assessment penalty or criminal enforcement would be to charge full cost recovery, whatever those permit fees are, the full cost of it, if they are permits that are requested after the fact. And that would be something to consider during mm -hmm. your discussion of the user fees. Thank you. Yes, and that cost can be very high. I think planning commission is 3500 and council is 4500 so that'll be a lot. Okay, uh, please vote. Motion carries 5-0.
Thank you. That is item 8A. Now we go to our study session on user fees, proposed user fees for 2013. And that will be proposed or presented by John Adams, our finance director. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor. Give us just a second to get the PowerPoint up. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council members. Uh, this evening, um, staff is here to present um, as a um, public meeting study session citywide user fees for 2013 through 2015. Um, just briefly, I'll provide a brief background and history. I'll provide some highlights and some recommendations, um, and then we'll ask for questions, answers, and council direction. So quickly, what, are, uh, what fees are we covering this evening? Um, um, I'm sorry, um, fees for all city departments. Um, I've listed them there, everything from city clerk all the way down to police department. Um, we will also be talking about development impact fees as well. Um, user fees, just a reminder, this is part of our budget process, our two-year budget process. Um, we review and update fees every two years. Um, there are over 250 user fees and really seven different uh, fee items. Um, we um, will be talking about non-development related user fees. Um, we'll be talking about development related user fees. Um, and I want to just mention on the development related, we did update our cost study, um, that model, um, which we have been doing regularly every eight to 10 years. Um, we did re update it this time since 2007, which is a six year hiatus from updating the cost study, and mainly because of the significant changes in both um, staffing, expenditures, and fee activity. Just sort of, uh, just quick discussion on full cost recovery. Um, I want to highlight state law, which more or less says that we cannot charge anything above reasonable cost for services that we provide. Um, council policy, um, certainly community-wide versus special service. Um, that general purpose fees should be used for community-wide services where full costs um, for fees should be charged for those that benefit. And I want to talk about Community Budget Task Force in 1999. One of the policy objectives that they provided was that in the absence of specific public policy exceptions, um, fees should be implemented to achieve full cost recovery. And I think those are three important items as we go through the process. Um, user fees is a quick definition of user fees, um, and it's a fee or rate charge to an individual or group that gets a private benefit from the services that the city provides. It's not a tax, it's not an impact fee, and there are gray areas. Um, just some common fee concepts. Um, the cost of service is not arbitrary. We do go through, look at all costs. Um, we don't have unintentional subsidies. We know when we are subsidizing a service, and there is... Um, we cannot charge more than the reasonable cost. Um, the manual that's in front of you tonight, um, hopefully that you got a copy of the manual, um, is not just fees, but also includes fines and penalties. We also include rates and charges, and we include assessments. So the user fee manual that we're covering tonight actually is in two sections. The first section is provides you the fee, the fee detail um, for each fee. Um, and the second section is the comparison between the current fee and the proposed fee. So just to highlight, we do have three new fees that we're adding to this manual or proposing for fiscal year 13 um, through 15. Zone clearance, miscellaneous rental fees, which really has to do with the theater department, and final map in-house uh, review. So the first thing we cover is just development impact fees, and this really is based on the cost model and, um, and how we've updated and recommend changes to those development-related fees. Um, we did work with the principal at Wolford Consulting staff staff in both engineering, um, community development, both planning, code, import, um, code compliance, and building and safety. Um, next slide. Um, the objectives of the cost study was to ensure compliance with state law, which means that costs aren't above, or fees are not above the cost of providing. We looked at simplifying the, C, uh, the fee schedules. Um, we want to enhance fairness and equity on the fees and those that are benefiting from the services. Um, we want to understand the full cost of providing the fee. And then, as far as developing insight on the rational, rationale of the basis of setting the fees, and then just understanding the subsidies. 
So this is just a simple chart to show you um, user fees, 100% cost recovery when someone's receiving 100% public ben or private benefit. And this goes all the way back to um, what is supported by taxes and a public benefit, which would be police services, which is number four. And then there's stuff in the middle, which recreation is partly funded by taxes, partly funded by user fees. And then you have something like advanced planning, which is really supported by taxes with some user fees. So when we talk about cost-based methodology, um, this is not a tax. We are doing unit buildup. So we are doing time estimates. Staff is looking at costs. Staff is looking at time estimates and applying costs related to those time estimates. So we calculate staff time, direct costs of individual staff positions. Um, we looked at overhead and support of those positions. So just when we talk about full cost, what does full cost include? Full cost includes direct salaries and benefits. It includes supervision and support. It provides department administration and, and includes cross-departmental support. So that is when we talk about full cost, what we're including, not just the staff time, the supervision of that staff, the department administration of that staff, and then the, um, the, the cross-department um, support, which could be finance as an example. Um, so the results of the cost study and the update of the model is that each department's development related fees are under full cost recovery. Um, the proposed adjustments that are in the fee manual will move them closer to full cost recovery. Um, you will sh see when we show you the full cost recovery, each department's a little different. Each department's recommendation and each fee is looked at individually. So if you have certain fees that are closer to cost recovery, we might not have made um, this a larger increase or adjustment on fees that were farther away for full cost, we would have had a larger um, adjustment. Um, and again, every individual fee was looked at. So we didn't apply a certain percentage across all departments, whether it was planning, building and safety, or engineering. We looked at in each individual fee and adjusted it accordingly. Um, here's the current cost recovery rates when we talk about building at 67%, um, planning at 46 and 46 I want to talk about planning. There are several um, city council exceptions to the planning fees and that's why that number is um, substantially lower than the others. Um, engineering at 76% and code compliance at um, 75%. So tonight we're actually the recommendations for each of the development related fees. Um, the easiest way to really um, discuss the adjustments is what is the percentage of the revenue that will be the result of the fee activity based on the services that are provided. And so we provide you adjustments um, for planning at 4.9%, building and safety at approximately 86 and there is a decline in engineering at 42 And that's mainly because some of the higher fees were reduced and based on the fee activities, um, those actually have a reduction in revenues. So um, one of the things that we're going to provide you is just a simple comparison of our fees to a few of our um, comparable cities. Um, when we did the, the cost study in 2007, we identified um, approximately seven cities, I believe, um, and showed comparisons of some very common fees. And so. Um, I, I want to, before I show you the slide, I want to just make a few points is these are the fees. These are not the cost of providing the services. So we're showing you the co or the price of the fee for the service. Um, and fees differ. Fees differ for policy intent, whether council is subsidizing intentionally a certain fee, um, service levels, methodology. Some cities do a cost study every six to ten years. Some haven't done one um, for 20 years. Um, so I want to make those comments about this comparison. Next slide. Um, in the fee comparison, we took approximately uh, 10 fees, um, compared them from what Thousand Oaks charges. Um, we char uh, compared them to Santa Barbara, Ventura, Santa Clarita, Simi Valley, Carlsbad, and Fullerton. And these were the cities that we used in 2007. And you can see that they really range the full gamut. Um, and so. Um, we're showing you a comparison. Um, you look at a city like Santa Barbara whose fees seem to be high and part of it is is um, maybe their perspective on development and, and, and their cost of providing those services. Um, you might have another city that might have lower fees and that might be because they're trying to encourage development. So anyway, that's the comparison of uh, the other six cities. Slide. 
quickly, I'm just going to talk about uh, non-development related rev um, fees, and um, and I'm going to talk about each department. So for um, non-development related fees, we did a cost study for the development related fees. For non-development re um, um, related fees, staff, your city staff, um, took a look at each fee and made recommendations if it needed to be changed. Um, we used time and materials, looked at process methodologies, and identified new user fees. Um, next slide. So for those fees that are based significantly on labor, um, we did calculate labor changes between fiscal year 2011 to 2013. That calculation was 2.7%. So any fee that had significant labor components was adjusted by at least the labor factor. And then um, total fees. For city clerk's department, they have four total fees, no recommendations for city clerk. If you look at the manual um, in the second section, there are fees start on page two, and that shows you the comparison between 2011 and 2013. Um, citywide fees, 11 fees total. Um, nine, nine fees were not recommended for changes. There were two changes, one for rental of a conference room and the other one was related to community art gallery. Um, building and safety, 27 total fees. 20 were part of the cost study. Um, the other seven um, were recommended with no changes. Planning fees, total of 81 fees, 70 were part of the cost study. Those were adjusted according to the cost study and, the, and, and recommendations. The other um, six for uh, code compliance were also adjusted. Um, animal control fees were mirrored with the county because they provide animal control services. Cultural affairs, um, 42 total fees. Um, there were no um, there was only one new fee. Um, the other fees that were um, done by a theater's department, um, are based on the September 2012 action um, in which there were recommendations. So we felt that we, since it's been less than a year that there was no recommendations to change those fees. Um, finance fees, 14 total fees, 12 fees to remain at current um, rates. Um, two fees um, were changed to comply with um, law. Um, library fees, six total fees, five to remain at current rates. The one fee that was revised um, will be reducing color copy charges. Um, for police, seven total fees. Um, the one that I want to highlight is the tow fee. As you know, we had some um, recommended changes to tow fees last year. Um, we are uh, making all four tow fees at $163. Um, public works, total of 64 fees, uh, 34 were, made, were related to the cost study. The majority of the non-development related fees were adjusted based on labor charges. Um, and I give you some examples uh, of um, some of those that were adjusted. And then um, these are the city council exceptions. We talked about there are certain city council exceptions and that's why in planning that fees are less than full cost recovery. These are ones that have been um, the exceptions to full cost recovery. Um, at least since I've been here, um, but these were set by council policy. For 14 total fees. Um, what we are showing you in the current exception is the current rate, and then the proposed exception is the proposed rate. And when I mean exceptions, that this is the um, the rate that we're going to charge based on um, not being at full cost recovery. Development impact fees. We've talked a lot about development related fees. We talked about a lot of non development related fees. Development impact fees are related to capital um, fees that are charged to developers for capital improvements and in infrastructure. Um, they include road, road fees, traffic fees, police facility fees, wastewater, water connection fees. Um, 10 traffic fees total um, based on the construction, the California Construction Cost Index, we're adjusting them 3.13%. Um, wastewater fees, because we're in the process of updating the plans, both wastewater and water charges plus connection and development impact fees um, will be brought back to council when the financial plan is completed. Police facilities fees, this fee was established to reimburse the city for the cost related to East Valley law enforcement um, facility um, and is being adjusted 1.8 based on the cost of that borrowing money over the last five years. And then so staff's recommendation um, to receive information on user fees and development impact fees is present as at tonight's uh, public meeting um, and provides staff direction as we continue. And then uh, to schedule a public hearing for April 23rd, 2013. So staff's available for any questions. Sorry for going through that presentation relatively fast. Um, available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Um, yeah, I don't think it needed to be any longer because it's pretty standard yes, it uh, is. every year. So uh, thank you very much for that. 
Uh, do we have any questions from council? Mr. Fox? I didn't see it in the report. I just did some quick math, but maybe it's here is. Based on our current use, um, it looks like it's a net gain of about $200,000. Yeah, and, and let me... The it's not in the report, is it? No, it, it, when you look at total user fees, it's very, there is no total right. across the board. What we try to do is specifically highlight the, the, development in, the development related fees. And when you look at planning and building and safety and um, engineering. I'm just looking at your fiscal impact. The fiscal impact out. are the significant fees, are, are really where the significant dollar amounts are. When you talk about the non-development related, they're relatively small. Um, what we can provide um, at the next council meeting is our estimates, our total estimates for and, the and adjustments. And the reason for the, assuming just in round numbers, the reason for the, what is a net gain of $200,000? But first of all, is, is that a correct statement? Um, in the it's development round numbers, John. I'm not trying to. Yeah, hurt. it's 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 probably a little more, but it's closer to three hundred thousand. Okay. Um, um, yes. So the reason for that is that what those development related fees are not close to. Well, they're not at full cost recovery. And the reason they're not at full cost recovery, recovery. is. Um, Full cost recovery. When we did the update on study, and you have to go back to 2007, fee activities have changed. As you can imagine, over the last six years, activity levels have changed. We have reduced staffing. Costs have changed. And so we take a snapshot, and based on the information that we were using, which is current costs and current fee activity based on current projected revenue, there is the cost recovery at 75%. Okay. It's very dynamic when you talk about cost recovery. Um, and what I mean by that is is that we can project fee activity, but we don't know what the activity is going to be as far as how many building permits are going to be issued, how many planning projects are going to start. And so you try to have this balance of where are we projecting fee, act fee activity, and then we have our costs. And so when we're looking at the full cost, it's based on current, current activity, current dollar amount stuff that we know. Um, would it be fair to say that the majority of the cost recovery is in salary and benefits? Um, in the development impact or the development related fees, most of the cost is salary and benefits, right. either direct or indirect. Okay. So um, if council were to look at uh, labor costs and make adjustments, that would impact uh, these fees somewhere down the road. They would be out of alignment, would they not? Um, Yes, they would. It, meaning that if we increase uh, salaries or decrease salaries, or cut have, salaries, or cut salaries, there would be some impact on one way or the other. That's a correct statement. Okay. It, and and right, maybe, I, maybe thank you. Okay. Any other comments on that other side, Mr. Adam? Yes, sir. I, I, just a question: If we're not achieving full cost recovery in the, this engineering uh, area. Then why is there a negative uh, adjustment? Um, what for engineering? John, I don't have a problem with a negative adjustment. No, no, no. Here's and yours. and I think the the difficulty for us is is when when you're looking at every single fee. And when I say on development related, we looked at every single fee. We did time estimates for every single fee, and there were fees in the engineering fee schedule, especially on the higher ends um, sizes of projects that were maybe higher than what the costs were based on the most current calculations. And so those were being adjusted. Now the impacts, if I reduce a fee that might be $50,000, if I reduce it by 5%, but there's a lot of other fees I reduce 10%, but those are $1,000 fees, it's gonna have a higher, it's gonna have a, a larger significant impact on the total revenue. Mm -hmm. And so it's very difficult to say that we adjusted engineering fees all down by a, ne by a negative adjustment. Some of them went up, some of them went down. The impact on revenues based on activity levels mm -hmm. is a decrease in revenues. Right. So I cannot say that every engineering fee went down. Okay. No, I understand. It's a combination of things. Uh, and in this business on page 64 of these fees where uh, it's been suggested that you know, there be exceptions to full cost recovery, I, I presume because they impact the citizenry maybe a little bit more than some other fees. 
Um, yes, and, and these the are common. Are... They have been exceptions. Um, right. I certainly can only talk as long as I've been here, but these are exceptions that are annually adopted by city council. And that's the point. You know that there's an, an intentional subsidy or, or an exception to the full cost recovery policy and council has reconfirmed that every time they've adopted new fees. So why would we want to raise them then? In some cases, because costs did go up. So we do want to increase them, um, but we're not moving them up to full cost recovery. Um, so it's, it's, it's really each fee, again, looking at individual fees. This is recommendations by those program staff and ultimately the directors of each department are making those recommendations. All right. I'm glad to see the block party fee didn't rise. Um, yes, I, <laughs> That's yes. Good. Uh, and as far as uh, direction to, to staff from this particular council member, I would ask you to uh, look very closely at the uh, theater fees, considering the, fact, the challenges that we've had with the theater uh, of late. I think that it, it uh, deserves a, a very close look. In fact, as a matter of fact, I, I've, I've heard that our commercial fees, for example, you know, a, a corporate body coming in to rent one, one of the theaters, like say an Amgen wanted to have a, their annual meeting in our big theater. I, as, I, as I have heard, and this is strictly anecdotal, we're very underpriced okay. compared to some of the competition. For example, the Valley Performing Arts Center uh, is substantially more than what we charge now. I think that's something we ought to take a look at. Um, and let me, let me make a comment before because, Barry uh, makes you know, a comment. When you talk about full cost recovery, uh, you know, I know it's not feasible, but in the theater's case, we gotta look close. And, and one of the things that we, in the staff report, we talk about the theater fees were reviewed and adjusted in September of 2012, which was before you became a council <laughs> member. And the mistake that Before we, the, the, the mistake the staff made is we should have probably included that staff report to give you a little background on why there were no recommended changes to theater fees because um, Mr. McComb did a lot of, spent a lot of time looking at fees and making adjustments to increase certain fees, reduce certain fees, and try to really encourage the use of the theater. So what we will do on the 23rd is include that staff report um, as part of the that would be good uh, yeah i mean that would that would and, and again um, they were ring adjust, a bell with me and they were adjusted just six months ago by the by the council back in september so i'll turn over to mr mccomb to okay. make his comments uh <clears throat> actually just very briefly uh last uh year about this time we undertook a pretty substantial study of other theaters of our size throughout southern california and uh, we looked at it from a variety of standpoints primarily a cost per seat uh, and we took a similar event and applied that event against each theater to find out if that event played all these theaters, what was the cost per seat on a theater basis. Uh, we found at the time that we were right in the middle. There were many theaters that were more expensive than us. There were some that were less than us. What we wound up doing was readjusting our rate card to make the theater less expensive to rent on a weekday, a Monday through Thursday, which tends to be a slower period for us to try to encourage more business. And then we raised rates on Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, which are a busier time that we're typically turning people away to try to maximize revenue during that period. Uh, so if you took a business meeting, uh, you would find that, yes, there are venues that are less expensive than us, uh, and there are some that are more. We certainly have not lost any business. Uh, due to the adjustments in our rates and actually one of the areas that we made significant adjustments in was film shoots where we were double what a lot of different venues uh, were charging at the time and that's already resulted in three shoots uh, since we changed the rates which normally would have passed us by. Thank you Mr. Cohn, that's good to hear. Mrs. Irwin. I have a quick question for Mr. Adams. A couple of years ago we had a full discussion on um, alarm fees and I was wondering if um, there's been have we collected any money with that has it reduced the number of false alarms um, yes and I I don't see my police chief here um, yes I, as you know we got relatively aggressive on alarm fees 100 200 500 after the first two um, we've had a few um, and I um, we, we've had a few um, troubled areas um, in those cases in which their fines have gotten to the $500 uh, 
um, we've actually had um, either the police chief or one of his key staff members go out there and meet with those businesses and they really have become just businesses and it's you know um, I, I don't want to identify any one business but it's um, where we've had the issues has really been on businesses as far as the 100 200 it has really subsided the amount of activity re um, related to false alarms because of the penalties and stuff and I think that our uh, police chief and our police staff has done a really good job of following up where there have been um, repeated um, false alarms. So I'll turn over to the police chief to make a comment on that. Madam Mayor, members of the council, we haven't had a significant reduction in the amount of uh, alarm calls, but when we do have a, uh, an habitual offender, uh, we meet with them, I meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, um, encourage them uh, to pay the fees, and then we give them some help to uh, fix the problem. Thank you. And maybe I should clarify when we say not, a red I mean, again, as far as the number, uh, the, the amount of people that are being fined, um, we have not seen that increase, which is different than the amount of false alarm responses. Um, remember, um, a resident gets two free responses on false alarms before they're fined. So anyway. Um, once they see the notification of a hundred dollars, I, I think they're a lot more careful with that. I'm glad, uh, Chief, you added a P to the word H E L. I thought you were giving them some help. <laughs> help, help. Okay. Um, thank you. Are there any additional questions? No. Okay. Um, I do have a question regarding the um, Planning Commission. Uh, meetings or appeals as well as City Council. Um, I forgot now what the full recovery cost is of a City Council hearing to hear an appeal. You know, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have that information, the, the specific, but what we can do is we can get back. That one is, um, it is under cost recovery. And I, again, I'll, we'll get back to you on that exact number. Well, I'm I know sorry. it's over $3,000. Um, so, um, I just wanted to make sure bec that we will address this issue due to the outcome of the case we just heard. <clears throat> yes, and I think what I had heard earlier based on the discussion was mm -hmm. we were potentially coming back with some recommendation for a fee to make, um, to charge a, to, to increase if someone's not getting the permit or not going through the correct process, which we will work with staff. but. When you were talking about the cost of an appeal to the city council, um, which is a little different than mm -hmm. what we were talking about earlier, the current fee is fourteen hundred. Um, yeah, let, let us get back to you. I'm, we're trying to pull up the actual cost study that shows the cost, but. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, since our budget task force had recommended that we move toward 100% full recovery on everything, if at all possible, I just wanted to know um, realistically and practically on the planning, in, in, within the planning department uh, where we are at 46%, how much could we raise the fees um, to move more toward the 60% range or so? Um, in order to move to the 60% range, you would have to do a, a third. So it would uh -huh. have to be a 33% I mean, over increase. the next few years, obviously. Yeah, and, and that's not, um, and, I, and I think when we give you what the cost recovery rate is, and even in 2006, we weren't at full cost recovery, I think we need to systematically go through and increase rates. We show you that it's where the current cost recovery is. We make recommendations for this two-year process. We will come back two years from now, make additional adjustments based on what we project to be the full cost to try to achieve that full cost recovery. It needs to be systematic because if we're at 46% now, in order to make it full cost recovery, we would have to double every single fee, and that's just not Well, well we're not going to do yeah, that. Yeah. It's not realistic. And, and I don't think we'll ever achieve 100% full recovery. It's not realistic either, but certainly we can move higher than 46%. Correct, and that's what our recommendations always, that's what tonight's recommendation is, and the goal is always to, to try to move towards co the full cost recovery. We should be setting adjustments to fees to hopefully achieve that at some point. I don't think we'll ever get there because costs will change and fee activity will change, but our goals would be to 
systematically have adjustments to get closer to cost recovery. Thank you, and uh, Madam City Attorney, so when, you when staff comes back with the suggestion of Council Member Irwin or by Council Member Irwin, you will also include the full cost, cost recovery issue. Yes, I'll, as, be, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll work with staff on that on okay. how best to put it in the schedule. Thank you, thank you. All right, uh, any additional questions? None? All right, then I am looking, do we need, let me see here. I'm already on the next item. Okay, we, we really, we do have, oh, oh yes, one speaker card. Thank you, Mr. Kidway. Do we need, um, by direction to staff? Uh, Nick Kidway, resident of Newberry Park, director concerned citizens of Thousand Oaks, honorable mayor. Uh, I would like uh, the overhead to start with. Uh, this is from today's slide. Over 250 fees, over 700 different fee items. Uh, I think uh, we, a motion is needed to change the city's name from Thousand Oaks to Thousand Fees. Remember, these are not taxes, just fees. The mission statement should also be amended. I mean, I've always said that this mission statement is a waste of ink. Uh, extraordinary service to the citizens we serve at the highest possible fees, which are unjustified, is our purpose and product. Who would argue with that? Just going out in a break, I was looking that the city is looking for an accountant. And it, this is the organization that we are talking about to join, a dynamic, forward-thinking organization that values its talented employees. Wow. The city manager is busy reading stuff. <laughs> this is such an old, I mean, 30-style hierarchical form of, of government. It's run by one dictatorial uh, entity, and it's not his fault. That's the way it has been uh, from in the inception, and no changes have been made. I'm disappointed. Oh. Uh, as the mayor talked about this, if the TOTV can show that, uh, that's the increase uh, in the fees uh, for uh, appealing a decision. I appealed a decision uh, for the, from the Planning to the City Council in 98, and you know, it, I was made fun of because I got zero support. Uh, there was politics played by Linda Parks, etc. But I won't forget because I wrote the check, $500 to appeal. And now $1,500 almost. So I mean, who among, besides the city manager who's talking again, uh, who makes 300% more <laughs> since 98? I mean, not me, not even close. And look at the yellow light. I mean, on this, you should allow five minutes. I mean, uh, if you really. And then you have a government that does not answer, I mean. Uh, it's $1,500, and I asked, I mean, there's 30 people who have sent emails to the city to have the Hooters me meeting and, and bypass the administrative hearing, but no. Uh, it's not done. I mean, I, I don't understand. I mean, what, have we lost our nation? And if TOTV can show me, I, I'm TOTV, going to give you C's candy you. Uh, uh, for Christmas because I'm making you do work over time. That's, those are the losses. Uh, on these uh, things. You are not a business. I mean, it's, uh, it's a service that you provide. And we had a council, uh, uh, a candidate that ran on a platform that he was going to cut pensions, etc. The overhead of the city is too much. Uh, the perks are too much. The people at the top, they should be cut by 30, 30, like, like I've said. Thank you. Mr. Kidway. Yeah, look, I mean, I go to Camarillo. I mean, this is what they're giving uh, in CD format, and this is what used to be available in the city, and it's hard to even find anything. Everything is on the internet. That's not the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kidwai. I'm looking for a motion to, for recommendations one and two regarding the citywide user fees. Mr. Fox? Sure, I'll move the uh, recommendations one and two. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. We now go to the Herbs Road Widening Project, which is item number 10 on the agenda, and this will be presented by our Public Works Director, Jay Spurgeon.
Good evening, Mr. Spurgeon. Good evening, Madam Mayor. Thank you. And uh, council members, this project has been with us for a long time. It's been a long road for Herbs Road. And uh, so it's exciting to be here before you and uh, with recommend recommendations to move the project into construction phase. Uh, with me at the dais is Mike Tahidian, our senior engineer who's been the project manager for many years on this project. Uh, we also have some Herbs Road residents uh, with us tonight. Thank you for coming down. Uh, thanks for your patience uh, as we go through other items. Also, Chris Gabriel is our proposed resident engineer from Penfield and Smith, so we'll be talking about construction management um, a little bit later. Um, the project we're talking about is Herbs Road between Thousand Oaks Boulevard and Falmouth Street, uh, as shown on the graphic here. Herbs Road is the last segment, this, this portion of Herbs Road, it's the last segment of all the city's arterials and collector streets that doesn't have full, uh, full road improvements. That is, there's no curbs and gutters, sidewalks, bike lanes, and adequate lane widths in this segment. It's the last piece, the last one of all of our arterials. So that's a significant gap, if you will, in our transportation uh, system. And this project will, uh, will remedy that. As you can see also, the numbers here are, these are traffic volumes, average daily volumes. Um, Herbs Road carries a significant number of, of vehicles, uh, very similar to some of the uh, like uh, arterials uh, in, that, in that area. As I say, the project's been around for some time. Um, back in 1993, it was, it was included in the undergrounding master plan for overhead utility undergrounding. Uh, Herbs Road, the segment, is on that list. In 1997, it was included in a list of 31 different road segments that um, was part of a circulation element amendment. In this case, Herbs Road was reduced from four lanes to two in that amendment. Uh, 2005, the EIR for the project was certified. 2007, council approved the preliminary design. And then over the last three years, we've been working on obtaining right away necessary for the project as well as moving into the design phase. Uh, we obtained funding and we opened bids at the end of 2012. The project objectives are, in a sense, what I mentioned already, is to complete the roadway. And this is to address both traffic and safety concerns. Um, sidewalks provide for greater pedestrian safety. Bike lanes, obviously, for bicycles, bicyclists. There is a lighted equestrian crossing at Hauser Circle and an additional segment of equestrian trail. Uh, improvements at Herbs Road and Hillcrest intersection will increase the uh, level of service there. And then undergrounding of utilities provides both aesthetic and safety um, enhancements, and then there's landscape improvements as well as part of the project. Uh, this is a view looking from Thousand Oaks Boulevard northward, and there are uh, several very beautiful, large heritage oaks that currently sit right out in the middle of the roadway. And the design for this project will include curbs and gutters around those so that we improve the safety, but we can also uh, we can keep those trees as part of our uh, as part of our many oaks in the in the city. Uh, this is a little further north. Um, again, uh, coming up to Hillcrest Drive, you can see there's overhead utilities on the left-hand side. This segment from Thousand Oaks Boulevard to Hillcrest uh, already has a number of segments where the uh, utilities have been undergrounded by past development projects. This pro this project, our project now, will complete that. Uh, as well as going further north in, in undergrounding. This is a view north of Hillcrest Drive. Uh, this is the segment that uh, poses a number of challenges. What we, the design here avoids impacts to the uh, many large oaks and the riparian habitat on the west side or the left of this, this view uh, in that drainage, uh, drainage course there. And so we will be widening to the east or the right hand side here that gets us into some hillsides. It gives us challenges with some of the driveways. Um, we will be building retaining walls there. And that segment is really where the majority, almost all of the tree removals, about 15 trees, have to be removed as part of this project. And that's where they occur. Uh, driveways, there are 51 total that are impacted. Uh, but nine of them, really, in that segment, uh, north of uh, Hillcrest on the east side, uh, such as these three here are, are the challenges. They're very steep. 
uh, narrow in some cases. As we widen into those properties, we will be needing to build retaining walls onto the properties to maintain their access. Here's a typical cross-section. Currently, in the, at the narrowest point, the uh, pavement width itself, which includes two lanes and a turning lane and room for everybody else, is only 42 feet. This proposed cross-section from back of sidewalk to back of sidewalk will, is 58 feet, so there is significant uh, uh, widening there. And you can see the, the bike lanes and the uh, five-foot sidewalks on both sides where we need retaining walls, um, and they need to be fairly tall, a maximum of 10 feet. They'll be double-stepped, as shown here. Uh, there'll be some landscaping in between the walls, vines uh, planted to, to grow up and help uh, mitigate, soften those walls. Um, and uh, yeah, let's, let's, okay, this is the uh, Hillcrest Herbs intersection. So what we plan to do here is add a southbound free right turn lane and lengthen the two existing left-hand turn lanes to uh, over 300 feet. Those are very short now. They don't have very, very much stacking uh, capacity. So those will be lengthened. There'll be an additional northbound through lane that will be a merge lane that will drop after about 350 feet. Um, the, the, in the past, the level of service has been as bad as uh, D during peak uh, PM hours at this interchange or intersection, and these improvements will bring that level of service uh, to B or better. We've been fortunate to be able to move the project along over the last several years, including obtaining right away and getting the design completed. That allowed us to get the project to a shovel-ready position, and, and so uh, we were successful in getting almost $5 million of state and federal grants for the project. Without those grants, we would not be able to, s to move forward with the project. So very fortunate in, in that regard. Um, another real achievement is obtaining right-of-way from some two, diff two dozen different uh, property owners, or almost two dozen, uh, at a total cost of about $600,000. That took some time to negotiate the easements, both permanent and temporary construction, and discuss really the project over a number of years and a number of meetings with so many of the residents what we were planning to do, why we were doing it, the benefits, uh, including undergrounding. Um, and, um, and again, that was quite an achievement to get the, uh, all those uh, right away uh, easements. One of the things we are asking you to do tonight is approve an addendum to the previously approved EIR. This is because as we've gone through the project design phase, we've made some minor changes to the project scope. We've realigned the roadway uh, softens some of the um, some of the widening here and there, and uh, to mitigate impacts. In fact, the new project description reduces the impacts. So we need to do an, an addendum per sequa. It's um, it's the appropriate uh, action to take. But for instance, uh, by making those design changes, we're able to save two additional very large mature oak trees. Uh, one on either side of Herbs Road um, north of Hillcrest. So uh, we're very, uh, very fortunate to be able to do that. I want to talk a little bit about the project costs and funding. On this table summarizes costs for both the uh, previous design and environmental right-of-way phase and, and then the construction phases, which is where, where we're at, ready to kick off now. Uh, total project, $10.9 Clearly you can see a significant portion of this project is underground, 4.3 million. Um, the, um, the construction costs when bids were open came in higher than our estimates. Uh, staff and our consultants had uh, thought that the total project would be about $2 million less. So that's a significant difference. The, the bids do substantiate the actual cost though. Uh, one area that was significantly different from the estimate to the actual cost was the undergrounding of conduits, the vaults needed for undergrounding the utilities, as well as all the work required to convert current overhead services to the residents, the churches, the apartment buildings to underground. So considerable cost there. In fact, the difference there was over a million dollars. Uh, other areas where the cost came in higher 
uh, earthwork and grading, uh, traffic signals, and landscaping. What the estimates were based on were um, previous costs, actual construction costs, that we had seen, um, and, and we experienced that as well, over the last several years, lower construction costs due to the economy. We're seeing those, um, some of those savings um, not, not moving forward. I think this is an example here. Uh, one of the things that has made our recommendations for funding a challenge is the loss of $1 million of RDA funding, which previously had been allocated for this project. The undergrounding portion of the work can only be paid for out of certain funds. You cannot use federal or state grants. You cannot use gas tax. You can't use many of our developer fees. They're not eligible for undergrounding. So that leaves us with only certain types of developer fees, general fund, RDA would have been able to do that. So part of our recommendation tonight as, uh, as part of this project moving forward is reallocation of uh, certain developer fees and appropriation of general fund fees of, of, I'm sorry, general fund capital reserves so that the undergrounding portion of the project can be funded. As expected, there will be construction impacts to the project. Um, our construction team will need to work very closely with the contractor to provide construction staging, um, traffic control, to minimize the impacts both to the public that commute through this area as well as our, the residents that live there uh, in keeping the uh, closures of lanes, driveways to an absolute minimum. One of the things that uh, we'll need to coordinate very closely with is when the conversion between overhead and underground uh, utility services to the residents and, and whatnot are done, that those are kept to a minimum so outages are, are minimized. Um, clearly, we're going to need a very thorough public outreach program for this project, and we do plan to do that. Uh, one of the things that we'll be maintaining is a project web page. Uh, that's already in existence, and we've been updating that, but as we go forward, We'll be providing regular updates on traffic closures and uh, project schedules and whatnot. Uh, also through our social media outlets, uh, we'll be providing those updates. Uh, construction signs, of course, in the construction zone itself. And we'll be making personal visits, construction team, to the neighborhood residents, the churches, the apartments, uh, beginning as soon as next month uh, and throughout the project construction. This is going to take a lot of coordination and a lot of uh, working with uh, the, the affected residents um, as we go through this. Um, and so to that end, one of our recommendations is to retain Penfield and Smith as the construction management firm to help us with this project. It will require full-time attention during the construction phase and uh, Penfield and Smith was selected as part of our open uh, competitive process. They've done a great job for us on other projects, including the Norwegian grade uh, reconstruction. Uh, really did a tremendous job of, of managing that project, so we're recommending that they come on board as part of the team. So our schedule is to, again, start the public outreach as early as uh, next month. Probably the construction in earnest wouldn't start for another two to three months. Uh, we expect to be done by next May. And in closing, I just want to kind of highlight the benefits of proceeding with the project in, in its entirety. There's been some discussion along the way, including amongst ourselves, whether we should just uh, go forward with the road widening and not do the undergrounding. We don't recommend that. Um, this project is ready to go. There is funding uh, based on, on our, our proposal to get all of the work done, including the undergrounding. The, uh, the project would complete this roadway section in, including the beautification and safety enhancements of undergrounding the utilities. If we split the project out and think we're going to come back later and do the undergrounding, uh, costs would be greater, and then we've got all the impacts, again, that would we be um, you know, giving to our public and our residents there. And frankly, if we don't do the undergrounding now, we probably will never do it. Um, our federal grant funding, if we delay the project, may not be available at a later date as well. So we think there's some very compelling reasons to move the project forward. Uh, we're excited about it. Our recommendations are detailed in the staff report, 
Uh, they cover, again, uh, approving the, the addendum to the EIR, various construction contracts and, um, and approvals for the undergrounding, the project funding um, plan, and approving the plans and specifications. This was a green packet item. It's, uh, it's an appropriate um, action to include at this time with the other project actions. So thank you uh, for your attention, and we're available for questions. Thank you. Mr. Spurgeon, are there any questions? Mr. Adam. Uh, a quick comment. I, I, I agree with you 100% about the undergrounding. Uh, it would be very short-sighted to uh, not do that during this project because, I mean, as you say, you know, have to go back and do it later and more impacts to the residents, extra cost. I mean, it's a great aesthetic benefit, I think, and, uh, you know, we should uh, pay, pay now and get it over with. Uh, and I just had a quick question on that G2K that had made the mathematical error on the bid. You know, but their bid was the lowest bid by far. Unfortunately, it was an error, but didn't they want to come back and rebid? They were the lower, they were the lowest bid when the bids were opened by a million dollars. Yeah. Now it's very telling that the next three or four bids were all very close. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that contractor, uh, in addition to making their, their error on the bid, and the public contracts code allows for uh, the city council, in this case, to uh, forgive their bid and excuse them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, based on that. But in addition to that, we had real concerns about their experience. Uh -huh. Okay. This is a contractor who builds schools. All right. And they've never done a project that we're aware of in the public right-of-way. So we were very concerned anyway. It, it, they kind of... We're a little over their head, maybe. I, mean, I get no. you, Drift. Yeah. Okay, that answers that question. Thank you. Any additional questions? Uh, I do have a question. Um, we hadn't officially already awarded the contract to GK2, or what was it? G2K. No. No, okay. All right. Very good. Um, the question I have is the the financial ballet that we're conducting here on page 70 in order to fund this. And I was just wondering, if we are exchanging the gas tax funds, um, are the projects in first neighborhood, I mean the uh, neighborhood improvement programs or anywhere else going to be impacted by this? Uh, good question. And yes, there is a little bit of gymnastics here. And, and it all has to do with which funds are eligible to underground and which, which are eligible for the roadway work. Having five, almost $5 million to do the roadway improvements, we only need a, sh a very small amount to, for matching funds to complete the actual, to fund the actual roadway improvements. And we're using gas tax for, for those matching funds. The other funds that were previously allocated to the project in past CIPs, those are, those are funds that we can't use for undergrounding, so we need to uh, shift those out of this project and then shift pro money from other projects that had uh, these developer fee funds that are eligible for undergrounding into this project. So, sorry if that's not really a clear answer, but the, I, I guess directly, the direct answer is, is these other projects that are listed here, we're really just changing the color of money. So those projects are not impacted. Uh, we're not, not going to do any of those projects by, by these actions. We're just moving money that what money that was in the Herbs Road project to those projects and projects into Herbs. Okay. Uh, the miscellaneous developer fee fund balance, is that a particular fund that we're looking at? Is that, which, which one would, is that that we're looking at here? This miscellaneous developer fee fund is actually a, um, it's a mix of developer fees that have been collected. It's not, it's not the Chappelle or anything like that? Is that a separate no, one? No, no. Okay. What, what it is actually, it's, it's, it's funds that, developer fees that we've collected for older projects like the Borchard Interchange, like the extension of Lynn Road, other road payback fees that we've collected over time and they've been sitting in, in these accounts. Okay. And so we've kind of activated these funds. Uh, Were they years. collecting interest? Yes. Okay, good. 
All right, um, but as long as I know that none of the other projects will be impacted directly, especially the neighborhood improvement program. Well, the neighborhood then, improvement program is actually completed. Okay. And we actually Good. had uh, fund savings. There mm -hmm. were extra funds uh, from that project that are being um, transferred over here. That, that project's done. Okay, and then the other question, my final question, is regarding the amendment to the EIR, the final EIR. I have not seen the council, uh, or at least as long as I've been here, actually amend a final EIR. How often does that happen that we run into issues or discover other things that require us to amend a final EIR? I would say not often. Um, in this case, we're actually, uh, it's an addendum. Um, there are minor changes. There are actually uh, changes that lower the mitigation, the, the impacts. I'm sorry, lower the, the impacts to the project. So um, that's what we're doing here. But city attorney. I was just going to mention that typically after an EIR is certified, if there are tweaks to projects, there are various ways to handle it. Under CEQA, um, you are not uh, required to prepare a new EIR unless there are certain circumstances, like change circumstances or significant revisions to a project. Um, there could be situations where you have made some changes that doesn't warrant an EIR but might warrant additional mitigation measures. This is at the lowest level of all. This is basically acknowledging that there have been some changes to the project, but there are no new mitigation measures. So in those cases, what CEQA requires is that an addendum be prepared just to acknowledge that the previous EIR EIR, which had all of the potentially significant impacts and all the mitigation measures are still in place, but acknowledges that there are minor tweaks to the project. Thank you. Okay, I don't have any questions. I just want to add that we do have supplemental information in our green packet regarding item 10A, and that is the addition of a, um, of, um, a condition, I think, or a recommendation, uh, an addition of a recommendation, which is going to be recommendation number seven. Um, any other comments? Mrs. Irwin. Just, just a quick comment that the Capital Facilities Committee did look at this extensively. Thank you. Any other comments? None? Then I'm looking for a motion. Mr. Oh, speakers. Oh, yes. Mr. Chris Gabriel, uh, followed by Sharon Heinz and uh, John Baker. Yes, my apologies. Mr. Gabriel. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, thank you, Mr. Public Works Director. My name is Chris Gabriel. I'm with uh, Penfield and Smith. And I uh, just wanted to uh, acknowledge that uh, we're very much looking forward to working on this project. Penfield and Smith, uh, as you may know, provides uh, civil engineering, land surveying, and construction management services to municipalities and will be staffing this with, our, with, I think, a really excellent team out of our Camarillo office. We've got over a dozen members of the team involved, and um, as well as several other firms, as well as sub-consultants with other expertise. Um, we're looking forward to working with the city staff and the neighbors uh, hand in hand, because I think this, this project merits that sort of involvement. Um, and we look forward to uh, mitigating all the possible inconveniences that may arise. And, and carrying it out um, with the least inconvenience to the public and to the neighbors possible. I'm here for any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gabriel. And uh, next we have Sharon Hines, followed by John Baker. Hi, um, I'm just a neighbor. I don't live right on the road of herbs. But I'm just here to speak for the equestrian committee. Um, I live on the right side of herbs. I'm the only horse person. All the horse communities over in the Caneo Oaks area. And I travel across herbs with my horse to, I know all the people over there, all the horse people. And they all want to come over to my side to go over to the um, open space area. But they're all very, very nervous. And they're so excited for this to happen. And you did a great job. I mean, this guy is awesome. And I just want to thank you for the horse people to get this road happening. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm, I'm glad to, to hear that. I'm glad that the equestrians approve. Thank you. Uh, John Baker. Uh, 
Uh, my name is John Baker. I'm a resident of Thousand Oaks. I live on Herbs Road. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor and other council members. This is a, a real privilege. I appreciate the work that you do for Thousand Oaks, and I'm not just saying that to butter you up. I really do mean it. Uh, I'm here because I live on that street. Uh, one of the very first people in the city I met 10 years ago when I moved here with my five-year-old daughter was Mike Tahidian. Uh, when I went down to the city to find out, hey, you know, we live on Herbs Road and my daughter's about to enroll as a kindergartner at Conejo Elementary and, well, there's this gravel path and I'm, I'm, I just, it doesn't feel very safe to walk with my little girl to school. And he said, well, you know, we've been talking about this road for years and it's been in the works and we've collected developer fees and, you know, it's going to happen, you know, just hang in there. Well, that was 10 years ago. My daughter's now in high school. And um, I've been in touch with Mike uh, over the last 10 years. I've been to most of the public meetings. I've been a big champion of this project. I'm going to lose 30 feet of my front yard in order to have this project become a reality, but it's incredibly important for the sake of safety. Uh, also, Sharon's husband uh, invited me to ride my bike. Uh, I, I'd never ridden a bike when I first moved to Thousand Oaks. He said, hey, there's some incredible bike trails in Thousand Oaks. You should try biking. And I borrowed her bike, actually, um, her road bike, which was quite challenging. And um, I loved it, fell in love with biking. But you know, the first 100 yards of every bike ride is incredibly dangerous. When I walk, go out my driveway, there's no bike lane on Herb's Road. I'm very, very scared until I get up to Falmouth, where there's an actual bike path. You might also realize, if you know bikers, that path coming down Herbs Road is incredibly traveled, especially in the winter. There's hundreds of bikers every weekend that come down, park there at the corner of Herbs and Hillcrest. Um, they turn on Hillcrest or they go in different directions. Um, it's a miracle that there hasn't been a, a bad biking accident there because there's so much biking traffic. So I encourage you, I implore you, I beg you, please approve this funding. Thank you. Mr. Baker, have you tried horseback riding? Uh, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> you have? Yeah. Okay. Very good, okay, thank you. All right, um, now we go back to a motion. And somebody was, Mr. Price. I would uh, move staff's recommendation one through six. I think this is a, a long awaited uh, project here that uh, needs to. One through excuse seven. Excuse me, one through seven. That's why I should put my glasses on. Um, a long awaited project that uh, um, you've been patient. Um, and I think it's time that we get it done. And I also uh, agree that uh, it would make absolutely no sense not to go through with the undergrounding now and, and uh, because we can ill afford it now, we'll be able to afford it less down the road. So with that, I make the motion. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, and now we go, and congratulations. You saw the construction schedule, yes? yes? Okay, very good. It'll be on the city's website if it isn't already. Thank you. Um, number 13A, which is follow-up reports on conferences attended by council members Irwin and Price. We have the information in our supplemental packet, and who would like to make the presentation? Mrs. Irwin. All right, we attended the um, uh, public safety conference, uh, a public safety committee meeting, and uh, the, the information is in the supplemental. We voted on a, a couple of action items. Uh, one of them in particular has affected Thousand Oaks, and that was the emergency telephone system abuse. Um, there's a big issue with what they call swatting. We had one of those um, cases a number of weeks ago in Newbury Park. Uh, automated traffic enforcement systems. Uh, this is those red light cameras. Uh, we have no interest in uh, taking those on in Thousand Oaks, but it was one way for cities that do have them to cl collect additional funds. And then uh, flash incarceration, there, is, there are a lot of issues with uh, realignment, and one of the solutions is this flash incarceration. The Public Safety Committee voted against it unless, um, and there, unless there was funding to go with it. A lot of interesting things that we considered, and uh, one of the best parts of the meeting is always that 
the um, update on what's happening with the legislature and all that information is in the packet. So I would uh, just receive move. and file. Receive and file. And Mr. Price concurs? Yes? Okay. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Uh, now we go to City Manager Scott Mitnick for any follow up items and announcements. Madam Mayor, members of the Council. A couple follow-up uh, follow items. Uh, early in the agenda, we heard reference made to the Hooters uh, project. Just for clarification, what's happening this week is an administrative hearing, and uh, if somebody wants to appeal that, it would go up to the Planning Commission, and if that decision were appealed, it would work its way back to City Council. So there is the ability for it to work its way back into the chambers. Um, we will follow up accordingly on the fee issues that you raised, and remember the hearing for that will be at the next council meeting. So that's a good uh, segue to the next council meeting. will be on April 23rd. Public hearings at this point that we know of will be the 2013-14 uh, user fees. Tonight you set the hearing date. Another hearing will be uh, involving a single-family residence at 2100 High Knoll Circle. This is um, another, similar to tonight, it'll be um, an appeal of a denial of a building pad expansion, um, et cetera. The uh, annual community development block grant action plan for fiscal year 2013-14 will be in front of uh, city council. Two study sessions at this time, the 2013-14 and 2014-15 capital improvement program budget, and we will have a study session on solid waste rates. Uh, we had a speaker on that tonight. That's it by way of city manager follow-up. Thank you. Thank you, and we will now going. We will announce closed sessions. Yes, Tra we have, Mrs. Snowden. Yeah. Yes, we have one final closed session item. It's a conference with labor negotiators, city designated representatives. Are the city manager Scott Mitnick, acting city manager. Assistant City Manager Andrew Powers, City Attorney Tracy Noonan, Finance Director John Adams, and Human Resources Director Gary Rogers, with the employee organizations TOSIA, TOMA, SMA, and the Executive Managers, Assistant City Manager, Finance Director, Community Development Director, Public Works Director, City Clerk, Human Resources Director, Cultural Affairs Director, Library Director, and all of those is pursuant to Government Code Section 54957.6. It is unlikely I will have anything to report. Thank you, Mrs. Noonan, and we will officially adjourn this council meeting to April 23rd. Have a wonderful uh, weekend and a good night.